audiobook titled Gate Journey in the New World, 00-37, by Dom2040 Part 03. This work belongs to author Dom2040, source scribblehub.com. Unfortunately, the young woman was not amused. Look, if you are trying to cheer everyone up, you might as well put more effort into it, she replied, with a hint of sassiness in her voice. I'm just trying to help you know. Karada wanted to demonstrate what he could bring to the table. He didn't mean what he said. As a member of a more practical circle, he wanted to show them things outside the box, things that might be able to get them out of this mess. Again, fantasy world stories won't help us right now. The young woman rephrased her statement, raising her hand. Look around you. We were just near the village plaza before, and now we're in the middle of nowhere. She added, not referring to the hometown of a certain pink cowardly dog. Karada slightly frowned. That's what I was supposed to tell you guys. The shockwave somehow transported us in a different area. He explained, much to the surprise of the other recon members. I know it may sound ridiculous, but that's what I noticed. What did you notice, man? Higashi asked this time. The otaku soldier sighed for the first time. The fog surrounding us right now, it has some kind of reddish tint to it. He explained as he tried to encourage the group to be more observant. The shockwave that hit the tent was red in color. He added, actually catching a glimpse of it. Turns out, his theory was right alone. The rest did the work and examined more of their surroundings. You're right man, they do have that reddish color. The amused Higashi commented. This is giving me headaches, Shino commented while rubbing her forehead at the same time. His claims might make sense but that doesn't make her a true believer of supernatural phenomenons. Mari, who has been keeping quiet during the conversation, had her attention drifted towards an unlikely spot facing the forest. Apparently behind the thick fog that blurred her vision, a figure of a person began to manifest. As she tried to dig deeper into it, more figures began to emerge as seconds passed, and slowly the realization would come into her mind and she felt this sense of fear afterward. Not far from the little circle of young adults, Lele found herself in the middle of her thoughts as she sat on the same chair prior to the tent collapsing from the unanticipated shockwave that damaged the entire premises. The young mage had been staring at the blank space for quite some time now, as she attempted to comprehend the tense magical energy that she had felt and seen during the blast. A sense of familiarity struck her. She felt this small worry that began to grow within her, and the more she placed the puzzle pieces back together, the more she realized the horrifying revelation. Images of a certain memory began to flash before her eyes. Particularly, a certain man hailing from Sadera, who had brought his kind assistance to Kota village, a man that strangely had the time in helping her with her own studies, a man of former nobility, that respected the honor of becoming an official and watcher for this village. He often would tell tales involving the wonders and achievements of the empire. More specifically, in preserving and saving the precious artifacts which were looted, stolen, and even taken as trophies of war. He would always pride about this certain artifact, mainly a certain scroll engraved with various symbols. According to him, it was passed down from generation to generation by his ancestors and until the artifact landed into his possession. He never showed it to everyone, even her teacher as well. She was the only exception truthfully. The evil that was born from the blood of the innocent men. She remembered that phrase from him very well. The tales that he had told regarding this land are home to a curse from a forgotten time and its strong connections with the scroll. It always made her wonder why many were not aware of its dark past. Even she failed to notice the remnants until the souls themselves revealed it for her. That's when it came to her own realization at the end and she stayed away from the man. Has the scroll been finally opened? Lala. At that very moment, a familiar voice called her name. She caught a glimpse of blonde hair and the warm smile as she was suddenly brought back to reality. Oh, sorry about that, Tuka. The young mage apologized as she rubbed her exhausted eyes. The elf girl continued to smile as she handed her friend a small water bottle. I guess you might need this, and it's actually impressive. You can literally see the water inside, she explained. If I remember correctly, the men in green call this material plastic. She informed the latter of this unique material while proceeding to survey her surroundings once more. Silence slowly took over the area. Are you sure we're still in the village? 
she inquired, only to be met with silence from the girl. When she returned her gaze to the girl, she immediately noted her anxious demeanor. Is there something bothering you, Lele? She asked again, to her concern. The mage sighed as she couldn't help herself anymore. They needed to know the truth of the matter at least. Tell me, Tuka, are you familiar with the tale of the Lycos? Both of the elf girl's brows were lifted. Um, yes, my mother has told me that story many times, ever since I was a little girl. She expressed her dissatisfaction, as the narrative was intended to scare children and deter them from remaining up late. But don't be concerned, it's just a myth. Her words had no effect on the blue-haired teen in general. In fact, it made her even more determined. She rose up from her seat and placed both of her hands on the blonde girl's shoulder, ignoring her water bottle. We need to tell them right now, she warned her elf friend. Tuka's head was clouded with bewilderment. The blue-haired teen's sudden burst of emotion had stunned her, and before she could answer, she was abruptly interrupted by a single yell from the men in green. Shit, what the heck is going on this time? It's almost seemed as if she was really destined to blurt out these kinds of words whenever things were going down to an unexpected outcome. Truth to be told, they were all fortunate for that for a new presence had entered the scene. The ambience surrounding them had eerily remained silent even until at this time of the hour. However, due to some sudden and creepy circumstances, all of them were forced to gather around once more. The tension in the air was quickly rising. Girls, please get over here right now. One of the men in green exclaimed a combination of worry and desperation filled his eyes. The two girls immediately did what they were told and rushed towards the spot. Tuka was now even more perplexed as to what was going on right now. Everyone appeared to be gearing up for some sort of conflict. Despite the fact that she had a lot of questions, she chose to be more watchful and would soon discover what was really happening. From the depths of the forest and fog emerged multiple figures as they slowly walk out behind the trees. By the time they stepped towards the light, eventually revealing their true identities. Villagers? I thought they were already at the safe zone. Higashi had wondered, his hands already shaking from this unexplainable fright. He couldn't seem to differentiate or make a comparison between these people and the other. They really were. Mari replied this time, sticking to the information that Daisuke had provided her earlier. It's just that I have no clue who these people are. She added, confirming their doubts. All the hairs in their own skin stood simultaneously. What concerned them the most was that all of these so-called villagers had pale skin. They all had the same emotionless looks, their eyes wide-eyed and without blinking. As they encircled the group, the remainder of their distinguishing characteristics became clear. Some had large fresh wounds on their foreheads. Others were looked as if they were violently eaten or scratched to death, and some of them had their organs hanging out from their bellies. That karata nearly felt like throwing up right on the spot. The highlight of it all was the eerie silence that persisted throughout. It was frightening and heart racing at the same time. The recon members were already gripping their rifles tight as they hoped that this won't go down into a violent path. Although, certain theories would then continue to pop up in their minds. Where are these people zombies or some kind of undead beings? A gust of wind, however, would dispel their suspicions as leaves from a neighboring tree flew towards these folks and actually passed through them. Shino was the first one to realize it. The young lady shivered as she immediately grabbed Karada by the shoulder and did not let go for the remainder of the time. Damn it! Why does it have to be a ghost? She exclaimed while her cheeks began to redden as she did not intend of cowering behind the otaku soldier, as if she was watching a horror movie, something that Mari had secretly noticed. Higashi, having the same feeling, tried to pass this through his own humor. I'm not a paranormal expert, exorcist, or Shinto priest, but I ain't afraid of no ghost. Higashi finally mentioned the line. Encountering ghosts wasn't part of their plans, especially in a reconnaissance effort much like this. They don't really have a proper procedure in this situation other than using their own imaginations to get out of this mess. In fact, Shino who was not a religious person started to silently pray to whatever god she could pray to. The young woman just really hated ghosts, and if she would everything in her power to get herself out of this nightmare. They were completely powerless in this position as it began to press in on them. However, one factor was overlooked by the JSDF forces. 
The gang was taken aback as the ghost-like villagers abruptly came to a halt. It didn't take long for a couple of them to stand aside, showing a specific pathway. A certain village girl donning a tattered dress then stepped out from the ghostly crowd, her eyes focused on the blue-haired teen. Seeing her eyes of despair, Lele took several steps forward to meet these ghostly villagers and as well as the girl. She immediately had figured out that they were trying to relay a message of some sort. She could sense a certain fear in them. Lele, what are you doing? You could get hurt, Mari exclaimed, expressing her concern for the young mage. The blue-haired teen responded with silence as she headed towards a certain spot where a ghostly village girl is currently waiting for her. What the heck is she doing? Shino spoke this time and added, And who the heck are these people? The situation was just too overwhelming for her. They are the spirits of the past villagers who used to live in this land. All their attention shifted to the elf girl. Spirits? Villagers? I thought Kota Village is the only village here in this place? And why do they look like they've been murdered many times? The elf girl took a slight deep breath. The questions were immediately overwhelming her mind as she too was confused. I cannot say for myself. The only thing I know of is that this land had a dark history of death and murders. She explained what only she learned and knew. You've got to be kidding me, sister. How come the villagers did not tell us about this? Shino commented, slightly cringing at the girl's statement. She had that small suspicion that the village might hide some secrets, which were forbidden to be told. I'm not really sure, ma'am. And what's the entire history of this place? Tuka could only give a nervous grin as she beckoned the rest to look at the young mage, who was surprisingly conversing with the ghostly village girl. It didn't take long enough for the outcome of their small discussion. Lele, on the other hand, had turned to face the others with a slight smile. At the same time, the ghostly villagers raised all of their hands and pointed to a direction, which showed to be a specific path leading to their intended destination. So that means, Karada trailed off, fully realizing the message that these villagers were trying to convey. Tuka smiled as a sense of relief washed over her. That's our path heading to the village. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Kato almost lost his footing as he clung to a nearby tree. He felt as if he were plunging into an endless emptiness, only to resurface on the soil. The picture of the beast's blood-red eyes had vanished, replaced with green grass and tree foliage. His spell had successfully transferred him to a new location, and somewhere in a nearby forest, which is a fit for anyone who is hiding for their lives. Reasons could be debt, atrocities, gambling mistakes, and many more. For the old man himself, a location like this would be fit for someone who is trying not to get killed by demonic creatures that were often thought to be only a legend. The old man was gasping for his breath as if he ran across the Rodinius continent with no breaks, rest, or whatsoever. He felt the weakness spreading all over his body and as well as the pain. Then at that moment, he began to cough out blood as his hands were suddenly covered with the thick red liquid. His mind turned to the wound on his side stomach, and when he glanced at it, he widened his eyes in surprise, having finally located the source of this other pain. A big part of his robes was stained with blood, and a single large scratch ran across the middle of his side tummy. As the blood continuously spilled outside, the old man watched in terror. He was slowly losing his blood and possibly near the hands of death. Despite his mana being depleting at a faster rate, he mustered everything he could muster, placing his hand on the primary wound and uttering a sentence. As the healing magic began to take effect, his hand began to glow. Temporarily relieves the pain and sealing the wound helps to avoid blood loss. However, it would require additional treatment to fully recover from any severe illnesses. The old man's body began to tremble as his worry for a certain blue-haired student of his began to grow. Not long after, Cato forced himself to stand again, his hand holding on to the tree trunk while his wooden staff acting as a support in the front. His mind focused on one goal as limped his way back to the main area. He couldn't believe that one single scroll would cause this ordeal and the fact that Marcus himself acquired such artifact is only known to exist in the tales told by many travelers. How foolish of himself for not realizing it earlier. He could only hope for the rest to figure out the precautions when facing this kind of evil. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X
the fiery flare of light that consumed their superior signaled that they were on their own. He vanished into thin air, like if they had just witnessed some sort of magical performance. Hitoshi's mind was in conflict as he and his fellow JSDF friend traversed through different paths of the village. The cold and dank atmosphere had greeted them, as they could even see their own breaths come out from their mouths. The extreme tiredness and panic mixed together was a real torture for them. It was the first time they were actually running away from their lives supposedly. If he were to ask Tomita, he would only say that distance and range was their advantage, but to what extent? Fortunately, in a twist of fate, the strange voice that continued to speak inside their heads turned out to be some sort of guidance. In form of whispers, the voice had reminded them to keep their mouths shut and not to say a word. In addition, trying to be stealthy as they can, the young man immediately rested himself against the adobe wall of a certain village house, gasping for his breath as he could. His friend on the other hand tried to quickly regain his composure from the shock that he had just witnessed. The small backyard of this colonial-looking house had temporarily become their small safe zone. Apparently, by the time they received the order from the 50-year-old sergeant, and without any hesitation, they began to fire and riddle the huge beast with 5.56 caliber bullets. It was successful at first as somehow their gunfire managed to damage it, spilling blood everywhere. But however, they immediately recovered from the ground and had set their sights on them. The two men couldn't believe they were witnessing something horrifying for the first time as the monster moved wildly and erratically. They couldn't just stop their tracks and engage in another gunfire. They heed to their guts and were able to survive a possible death, though temporarily. Damn it! How are we supposed to deal with that kind of thing? Tomita slightly expressed his frustration. Running away was not his forte. We can't just let them get away with it. They might be heading after the others now. The big Japanese man added, his own concern catered to his friends and comrades. He was afraid for their life especially the chief and the medical team. Hitoshi could only sympathize with the man. Third Recon was a tight-knit group of young soldiers. In fact, they all treated themselves as brothers and sisters, almost like a family. The young man really didn't get the culture of this group when he first joined in. He was the quietest of them all and rarely hung out with them except for the occasional duties and missions they were assigned to. Even until now, he was trying to understand it. Although, the worried look on Tomita's face had finally brought him to that point as he slowly realized what he was fearing all along. Hey man listen, he called out towards his friend. We're gonna get out of here and find the chief, and the rest of the guys alright? Hitoshi tried his best to reassure him. In times like this, they all needed that certain motivation to keep on going. The reason to live and to survive. Tomita took a few moments to process what the latter had told him. Sensing the man's willingness and dedication, he responded with a small nod and a smile. However, in that exact same moment, as they were about to venture out once more, the whispers made their presence to their minds as it said, Behind you. The two men froze simultaneously as confusion ran to their minds. There was nothing behind with the exception of a certain reddish adobe wall, but in just a few moments, both of their own instincts quickly took over as they jumped out of their current position just in time to evade the beast who burst and emerged from behind. Both of you mortals think you could escape that easily. The enemy growled in rage as he finally located his two prey. The beast considered this hunt as personal to him, due to being disrespected by the unlikely humans with strange green clothing. He may still have not regained his vision yet but he could still sense then. How dare you run away from me, the beast had said, as he immediately charged at the two men. Both Hitoshi and Tomita were able to recover quickly to face their enemy, and soon enough, they pushed the trigger on their rifles and began firing once again at the demon, raining him with multiple bullets from head to his feet. The sheer kinetic combined force of the weapons greeted at this time, driving it back a few distances away the bullets piercing and traveling through its body. Blood started to spill again, splattering a small piece of the men's vest and clothing. Once they halted the fire, they began to doubt whether it was enough to bring it down. The beast found itself on the ground once more, albeit with a grin. He then slowly went on to recover and released an arrogant laugh. You think could kill me with those weapons of yours? The demon taunted the men after, as he advanced his way towards them yet again 
This time he would repel every damage done by the two men. Tomita and Karada were enveloped in the same rage as they were eager to fire at the beast once more. But in that very moment, there was a small ball of blue energy that floated right past them, and then a voice that followed. You're not harming them, it exclaimed, displaying its own rage. Afterward, there was a small barrier that manifested in front of the two Japanese soldiers, as it immediately blocked the demon strike. Hitoshi and Tomita stared in surprise before shifting their attention to the unexpected newcomer. This way hurry! It spoke again as it headed towards a certain path, beckoning the men to follow it. Still shocked regarding the supernatural intervention, the two men did not hesitate as they burst out running and followed the mysterious entity. There was this small relief and peace that formed within them, and not long after an idea came into both of their minds as to where the entity was leading them to. Meanwhile, the beast had recovered once more and began pursuing them yet again. Hitoshi and Tomita ran as fast they could, going through yet another complicated path leading into their mysterious destination. As for the small blue orb that saved them, it once again gave them their only clue to their solution. You can't defeat the demon with those items. You'll need a more powerful weapon. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
as he held his back afterward. The effort that he mustered just to perform that kind of move took a slight toll as he nearly injured his back. The man found himself once again in silence as he arrived at another area of the empty market district. The eerie quietness also did not help to make him calm. He gasps for air as if he had raced a 20-kilometer marathon nonstop. His lungs were already pleading with him for compassion. His heart rate was not slowing down, and his thoughts were urging him to get back on his feet and be vigilant. Kuwahara decided to push himself for one more time, and when he looked to his front, he discovered that he was only a few blocks away from the main plaza. Something that really surprised him. A sense of relief filled his mind as he was near to his destination. Although, unbeknownst to him, the enemy's presence was now closer to him than he had ever thought. The food stalls had these tough and strong wooden roofs that could hold tons of heavy objects. And on top of one of these stalls was the beast itself watching the Japanese man from above. Its confidence was still at an all-time high, believing that it had the upper hand. It grinned evilly as it prepared to launch at him. Kuwahara suddenly felt a small gush of wind that blew past by his neck. He widened his eyes as immediately turned around to face his attacker, which was already in midair. The man tried to raise up his rifle but was already too late as the beast landed before him, knocked his weapon out from his hands, grabbed him by the neck. The beast growled in triumph as he finally could eat human flesh for the first time since being summoned by his master. But he wasn't aware that the man had plans of his own. Kuwahara drew out his knife from his gear and stabbed it through the beast's gigantic claws, causing it to roar in pain. The man did not stop there as he began to move his knife and slice the heck out of its hand, finally letting him go. He landed on the ground hard but forced himself to immediately recover. He drew out his pistol and started firing at the beast, hitting it on the eyes, nose, and chest, the firepower temporarily shocking it. He then rushed his way towards his rifle to retrieve it. Although, his enemy quickly recovered and also made another charge at him, to which it succeeded yet again as it managed to grab hold of the man. Kuwahara found himself being thrown away to a few distances. He landed and slid on the rocky ground, nearly hurting his ribs in the process. The man cringed in pain once more as he held his chest. His eyes continued to look at the beast as it slowly approached him with delight. He gritted his teeth as he tried to get back up, but due to the ongoing pain and the numbness that spread throughout his body, he wasn't able to. The beast then grabbed the man by the neck once more as it wasted no time in opening its wide mouth, showing the large dark purple tongue and the terrifying fangs and teeth that could only be seen in horror movies. The man could only pray and hope for the best outcome. It would be a miracle if he was able to overpower a creature like this but to his own fortunate faith, the gods immediately answered his prayer. At that very moment, his world began to slow down. The Japanese sergeant caught a glimpse of a silver arrow engulfed by a fire that suddenly hit and went inside the beast's mouth. The beast widened its eyes in shock as the fire from the arrow began to spread and it found itself being suddenly engulfed in huge flames. A certain blonde elf man stood on top of a shophouse roof as he prepared another arrow and fired once more at the beast. The demon screamed and roared in pain as the fire grew stronger and bent on taking its life away. Not a moment too soon, the powerful flames began to torture it and spread throughout its body. Hodder smiled with relief as he made it on time. The man who had successfully gathered enough materials to create a special silver arrow back at the now abandoned blacksmith's shop jumped down towards the ground to assist the injured man. Are you alright sir? He asked. Kuwahara could only nod and answer since the ache in his ribs had become excruciating. Hodder was quick to realize this as he placed his hand on the man's chest. He uttered a phrase as his hand began to glow signaling that the healing magic had began to take effect. Kuwahara quickly felt the strange sensation as the pain suddenly went away. This immediately shattered his skepticism and his belief in any of the logical things he had learned in life. Feeling better? Hodder asked again. Yes, thank you. The sergeant replied back, as he slowly recovered from the ground. We need to get back towards the village hall as quickly as we can, Hodder informed as he wasted no time laying out the next plan. The confusion then took over Kuwahara. I'm sorry. But can you at least please tell me what the heck is going right now? He eyed the latter seriously, demanding to know answers. 
It had been a while since he had not heard a decent explanation. The violent shockwave, the appearance of these demons, and the village morphing into some kind of nightmarish dimension. Everything was just too much to handle, and considering he is in another world, everything is just too complex to deal with. Hodder responded with silence, encouraging the man to shift his attention towards the beast, who still is engulfed in flames, suffering but surprisingly still alive, and showed no signs of dying. Be but how is it still moving? he asked. The elf man just nodded. I can't really explain that myself but, he elaborated, you won't be able to truly defeat them unless you discover the source of their power. He went on to say, still with the same type of disbelief in himself. He had once perceived it to be just a legend, despite the countless chroniclers writing their own accounts regarding these demons and their victims that span for hundreds of years. Unless the apostle of death is here to automatically purify them. Do you mean these things have a weakness? Kuwahara then asked. Or maybe like something that will definitely kill them permanently? The man nodded once more. Yes, and it's just right over that ruins. He replied back pointing to the red beam of energy located at the former site of the village hall. We have to get there as soon as possible and reverse its influence. Or else we'll be just another one of their victims. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
The dark entity eventually took the shape of a familiar young lady and the crimson red eyes that had shocked them all. Is that? She smiled at each of them, as though to reassure them that everything would be well. Following that, the young lady turned her attention to the tree trunk, her black ethereal-like hands summoning some sort of massive halberd-like weapon with a beautiful gothic design. Not long after, she slashed the huge trunk in half, causing it to disintegrate into small pieces as its remnants descend upon the soldiers. After several moments, the tension in the atmosphere drastically reduced, the men in green's supposed fates being thwarted by the dark entity. They found themselves in a much stabilized situation. Yuji blinked a couple of times, as he quickly went to monitor the Chocobo, where the young lady was currently riding on. To his surprise, she was still there, albeit already smiling about something. Don't worry men in green, we'll be arriving soon enough. The apostle spoke for the first time as she rallied the rest towards their destination. A great deal of confidence filled her eyes as she couldn't wait to finally purify the lost souls that had been terrorizing this land. Her actions and words left the recon members in shock and disbelief. They just couldn't believe what they had just witnessed. Their own minds went back to the previous words of the sage. As time passed by, they would slowly turn into believers. Truly that Ms. Rory is definitely different. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he discovered the young lady's true colors. He never informed anyone, but based on what he saw, the young woman he had come to know over the years was fragile, lonely, and reluctant. Despite her strong front, she had flaws, and she needed someone to help her get out of this kind of loneliness. The interest grew in him, and he found a reason to get close to her more and be the one that will eventually help her. That's why he donned the playful mask and became some sort of jokester much like his captain, and that certainly annoyed the young woman to the point it almost tempted her to beat him for being an idiot. Karata would always laugh about it whenever the topic was brought up, though. He had no choice because that's the only way he could introduce himself and befriend her. Nowadays, it was a streak of bad luck for the otaku soldier. His eyes still focused on the young woman, who along with Mari was currently conversing with the local village girls. A smile formed around his lips. He was glad to see that the young woman was calm, despite the situation they were in. The hope of surviving and getting out of this mess was still vague. Karada. His own thoughts were suddenly interrupted by the familiar voice of Higashi. By the time he turned to him, he was greeted by his confused face. Are you all right, man? He asked, expressing a little bit of concern for his friend. You've not been yourself lately. Is there something bothering you? The man added. A small smile formed around his lips. Oh, it's nothing. Just thinking about someone I know. He replied, losing his focus once more. He just couldn't get over these thoughts inside his head. There was slight quietness that took over before Higashi raised an eyebrow. Oh really? I hope this isn't about Shino, he said, coincidentally predicting his friend's thoughts. Trust me, man, she'll only go for the hunks if you know what I mean, he added, confident with his own warning. At this time of the hour, he was still able to bring out some of his jokes, even the possibility of them not making it out alive was obvious. Karata secretly sighed. That kind of rumor amongst the circle was already outdated. He forced a cringy smile towards the latter before continuing with his own thoughts once again. Higashi, on the other hand, was much more perplexed than before. The fact that his otaku pal was attempting to appear cool at this time, or whenever Shino was in the scene, he never really understood that part of him. So let me guess this straight. This whole situation is somehow caused by a scroll, which contained three demonic werewolves in it. For exactly, one of them has the ability summon another one of their kind into this world. Shino rolled her eyes. Okay okay, so four demonic beasts that had been terrorizing this place, and the many villages that had settled here for God knows how long. The elf girl and the young mage nodded and agreed at the same time. The older woman was perfectly summarizing their story in a perfect and simplified way. And you said that this is all part of an urban legend in your community? Mari spoke this time, trying to get the gist of this local folklore. The two girls nodded again, again, and again. They felt like professors in Rondell, attempting to educate these otherworlders. Yes, though I realized soon that this legend might have some truth in it. Lele explained and went on to say there are several important key books which discuss the legend itself, but only a few, which belong to travelers and chroniclers' accounts presented many pieces of evidence, and even a written first-hand account of these beasts, literally existing and slaughtering innocent people. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Shino gave a cringed and she rubbed her forehead. But why did these hairy shits have to appear after hundreds of years? I'm not really sure, ma'am. One of Sir Eldar's trusted village officials had somehow acquired the scroll that contained these demons. Lele explained once again. And to his mistake, he unintentionally revealed its story and secret to me, even though I didn't ask for it. She added, I'm just not sure how and why he released these demons from their prison, so I have to make it up for what he has done and reverse the scroll. I apologize for not informing you guys sooner. Quietness befell for a few moments. Tuka placed a hand on her friend's shoulders as a sign of comfort and support. It's alright, but I mean those demon werewolves should really stay inside that scroll and not terrorize people for no apparent reason again. She gave another of her own opinions. If you ask me, it's a freaking mess. The one thing about urban legends involving vengeful entities is that they terrorize innocent people for no reason. They should be killing the ones that killed or wronged them from the start an aspect that continued to annoy the young woman throughout. However, the elf girl had a different view of it. Growing up in a much more conservative and understanding culture, she wanted to explain that side of the story. 
Our people believe when your heart is full of vengeance, you quickly forget your own values and the principles, I guess it's the same for humans as well, as they begin to lose their own humanity. She explained, and it doesn't matter whether these people have good hearts or bad hearts, to their eyes, they are just victims. The best thing we can do is to help them get out from that kind of prison. You got a point there, Shino muttered as her mind was placed in a small conflict between believing these two good reasons, though she still had to keep her guard up if she had to receive the opportunity to meet them face to face. It was the large structures of the colonial-like houses that greeted the group. The overall atmosphere had drastically changed. The once vibrant scenery of the village had turned into a foggy ghost town. It didn't take long enough for them to realize that they have finally reached their destination. A small sense of relief filled their minds, especially Lele, who knew that they were not far away from their target. The glowing red beam originating from the ruins of a certain village hall became their only guide. The area that they stumbled upon was certainly different from what they had seen prior. Besides the somewhat newly built shop houses, were remnants of old structures from the past years. It was grey stone and old bricks compared to the adobe material that the majority of these village houses had. In fact, the area had more ruins than actual complete usable and livable buildings. It seemed as if there was an attempt to coexist with a forgotten past. I think I haven't been here before, have I? It was the first thought that came from the majority of them. Shino had to voice out the rest of it. If I'm not mistaken, these are the ruins of previous villages that settled here. All the attention went towards the young mage again. A small revelation that there were already people who have been living in this land for many years. It seemed that when Kota village had first arrived in this land, they didn't tear down the ruins and instead built their own houses beside them. Out of respect I guess? Truthfully? Lele only learned of this certain part of the story recently. When she learned of this information through Luke and his friends, she tried to enter the premises herself but got caught by one of the village patrol guards. It seemed that there was an order and warning given to most of the villagers not to enter the area due to the belief and superstition that the source of the curse originated in this part of the land. People were really afraid to venture towards the place. All she had learned regarding this were several ghost stories from the patrol guards themselves, who keep seeing these restless spirits wandering around the place. She was amazed by these men's bravery able to coexist with them almost every day and night. Her thoughts ended there, as she finally felt the tension in the air grew. As of this time, the group had entered a far more dangerous situation. The thick fog that filled entire ruins kept the tension in the air. A sense of dread was approaching them. It was not long after that the red beam of energy had suddenly released a small shockwave that engulfed the entire area and as well as the rest of them. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the voice kept repeating the same phrase all over every time he would attempt to yell. At first, Karada had thought he was finally losing his mind. Hearing the mysterious voices ringing inside his head was not usually a good sign. Although, there was this part of him that encouraged him to listen to the voices. So the latter took the advice and heed the warnings. That turned out to be a small saving grace as he immediately felt an overwhelming presence that had arrived in the area he was in. The young man felt all the hair on his body stood as he caught a glimpse of a huge shadow that quickly passed by a certain spot. Karada immediately raised his rifle as he prepared to engage, his hands slightly trembling for whatever the fear left in him. As he slowly continued his path, he whenever he felt something pass by through to other directions, he would always turn to those certain directions, unbeknownst to him, that the enemy was just playing games with his now fragile mind. He could hear the faint laughs of it, it was just everywhere as if it meant to torture him. Soon, the young man began to feel the faint footsteps approaching. Moments later these same footsteps began to get louder, as if the enemy is finally nearing him. It became faster and faster to the point that it was now charging towards him. Karada immediately turned around to face it. But to his surprise, there was nothing behind him. A wave of confusion took over his mind for a brief moment and unknown to his knowledge, the enemy was right just beside him. He heard an evil chuckle before a wall belonging to a remnant of a village house, burst into pieces as a gigantic hand grabbed him by the neck. The young man wasn't able to react fast enough, his rifle being knocked off to the ground, as the beast immediately raised him upwards. Hee hee, I really like to toy with my prey. The beast taunted as he threw the JSDF soldier towards the ground as if he was some kind of ragdoll. Karada winced in pain as he grabbed his arm. He tried to force himself to recover but the beast quickly approached him. You humans are really weak. The demon taunted him once again. I really wanted to kill you right away, but I do miss the pleasures of tormenting poor creatures like you. The demon widely grinned as he prepared his massive sharp claws, now ready as ever to rip the human's guts out. He wasn't going to waste any moment, as he was craving for his flesh. For the first time, Karada felt a wave of emotion within him. On the verge of breaking down, he ultimately remembered his promise to himself and to his friends that he won't be going out like this for nothing. And that kind of mindset eventually boosted his confidence. He still had two options left to finish this once and for all. Now to taste what the human fear is like all these years. As the beast was about to strike him down permanently. A voice suddenly rang out through both of their ears in the form of an unlikely tough young woman. Leave him the fuck alone. Once the voice was heard, a barrage of bullets suddenly greeted and hit the demon from all directions as it shockingly found itself pummeled to the ground due to the firepower it possessed. It left him incapacitated for a good amount of time albeit with vengeance in his mind. Damn you, the beast then cursed. Karada immediately recognized the voice as belonging to a certain Shino Kurabayashi. He began to survey his surroundings to find Mari, Higashi, and the tough girl herself, finally making their entrance. Hey man, are you alright? Higashi rushed to his friend as he quickly assisted him from the ground. The young man winced in pain once more as he soon realized that he had somehow sprained his right shoulder, the pain slowly spreading across his body. We gotta get out of here Karada. We can't really kill this thing right away. The bigger JSDF soldier explained, apparently remembering what Lele had informed them regarding this beast's nature. The weakened and injured otaku soldier simply nodded, as he let his friend assist by the shoulder, as they finally proceeded to leave the area. Meanwhile, Shino and Mari decided to leave before the demon wolf could fully recover. Meet us at the end point. Lele and Tuka are already there. They got surprised for this bastard. Shino yelled out towards them. Got it. Higashi was the one to reply back, as the two men were now about leaving. However, the beasts recovered faster than predicted and leaped in their way, finally blocking their passage entirely. This also notified Shino and Mari, who were forced to return to the area in order to aid their fellow recon members. Shit! Higashi cursed as he quickly drew his weapon and fired another series of rounds at the beast. He was able to pull the trigger and strike the now blood-covered monster, but the enemy was able to withstand the gunfire and shoved JSDF soldier, sending him away and crashing into a stone wall, 
semi-knocking him out of consciousness which left Karada behind again. Weak and injured, the otaku soldier, now alone, sought to retaliate by grabbing his backup Minabia P9, but it was too late. The demon quickly made his move as he used one of his claws to stab the young man in the shoulder. Karada yelled out in pain for the first time, dropping his weapon as he was brought up mid-air, his eyes looking straight towards the blood-red eyes of the beast. He he, you think you could get away from this mortal? He taunted again. At this point, Shino and Mari were now nearing the area, as they reloaded their rifles once again to combat the enemy. Karada! The young soldier could hear the loud voices of Shino and Mari worriedly calling for his name, as the two rushed their way to save their friend. A smile crept across the man's lips he took a glance at the two young women, who had just arrived. Just in time for Shino to look straight into his eyes, something that he had waited for a long time, and he was going to treasure this forever. Any last words, human? The beast said once more as it began to open its mouth to devour him. Karada was still able to take a deep breath and proceeded to extract something from a certain pouch of his. He then took the pin of this small but destructive green object with his other hand. Following that, he offered the most disgusted face he could show towards the demon, and along with his so-called last words. Eat shit asshole. With all of his rage and anger, the young man proceeded to throw the grenade towards the beast's mouth to which it suddenly swallowed, and not long after, a big explosion occurred in that very spot. Shino and Mari were startled as they arrived at the location and were met by a brilliant light. Their thoughts couldn't process what they had just witnessed. Only shock and horror filled the rest of their faces. Tears slowly formed in both of the women's eyes the light that had consumed their companion and the demon as well, leaving their fates uncertain. Chapter End And I'm so sorry that the chapter had to end this way. I had to cut the original 25k words and split it into two chapters, with this one being the first to be published, the next one being part of the finale. Another reason is that I'm quite mentally strained and tired in writing this chapter, so I had to end it with a small cliffhanger. But aside from that, Let's talk about the chapter for a bit. Regarding the action horror survival atmosphere, I had to tone it down for a bit in order to achieve a much simpler vibe. I didn't want to make the chapter more complex so I decided to make it more simplified as possible, and add other elements, to give way for the character interactions. One of them is a bit of comedy horror, such as the scene where Daisuke was forced to pray with the two village women in hopes to appease the spirits of previous villagers. A small bit of romance with Karada and Shino, I dunno, I just find their dynamic and relationship interesting. The hardest part was writing the action scenes. I had to rely more on character perspectives to better describe the scenery and the vibe that they are in. I wanted to add this sense of chaos and danger to every scene, and hopefully it will blend well. Regarding the demonic enemies, I really didn't want to add their background as an exposition dump, but instead, I wrote a specific scene for that and also left clues and small hints regarding it in the chapter. So far, the character perspectives will remain small and close in order to keep that certain vibe. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I would also like to congratulate the great DFMRCV for finishing his fight we chose FIC, and I wish him the best in his future endeavors. Hopefully, he won't retire from the gate FIC fandom. He has a lot of wisdom that can help many writers in their own fix as well. With that said, I guess this is the last of my thoughts regarding the chapter. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language and also please go easy on me since I'm not a member of any military organizations. 15. Arc 1, Code of Village Part 6, and Curse. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Lands of Rodinius, Code of Village Part 6, and Curse. The windy, humid weather did not help to alleviate the situation. A great deal of worry filled the atmosphere, and especially for this certain group of Recon members, who were in charge of managing the safe zone. Sergeant Nishina took a glance at his wristwatch before overlooking a huge number of Koda's villagers filling up the green open fields. The young Japanese sergeant had not expected to be this of a huge crowd that still continued to gather and adjust. Furthermore, the recon members assigned in this task were only him, 
private wataru, and private tusi daisuki, an impossible number to control such huge crowds. He could feel a little cold sweat of nervousness drop from the back of his head and towards his neck. How he wished that Sergeant Kuwahara was here to assist, yet the latter had been called to handle an unexpected situation back at the village hall, to which they haven't received any updates so far. The atmosphere surrounding the field of many of Kota's evacuated villagers was pretty much in a stabilized situation. It was a bit fortunate for him and the guys since they don't have to do as much and experience the struggle that his superior had to endure prior to all of this. Nishina's thoughts were interrupted while observing the current situation by the laughter of village youngsters, who had found the time to play during this difficult period that he had been going through as the team's acting leader for the time being. In fact, he was nearly struck by a very antique and ancient-looking leather ball that he had seen in a museum back in his homeworld. He only observed that these youngsters were playing a kind of early soccer game, complete with improvised goal posts made of wood and a net constructed of light ropes. In the midst of the situation trying to calm him down, his walkie began to come to life. Nishina, this is Wataru speaking. The voice of one of his fellow recon members came through. Copy that, how's the situation at the West End? He asked. By then, he had noticed that a large number of the villagers, mostly adults and the elderly, were entering silent prayer one by one. He sensed dread in the air, and it didn't come at a bad time. He had no idea why he had that feeling. Everything is going smoothly so far, but some of the villagers have started kneeling and praying. Wataru's voice explained, also claiming to have witnessed the same events. Nishina raised an eyebrow, his own curiosity began to peak. Interesting, so what's the reason? He asked again, as he began to walk towards the field to investigate further, not knowing that the air was slowly changing. I'm not sure, sir but they keep telling me that the evil in this land had returned and that they needed to pray to the gods for protection, he explained, looking as perplexed as he was. It's giving me the creeps, to be honest, he added. Hearing that statement, Nishina came to a halt in the middle of an open path, surrounded by wagons, horses, and small temporary camps set up by the villagers themselves. The young man's memory jumbled as familiarity struck. He had heard a certain story from one of the elders when the recon team first arrived in the land. It wasn't just the elderly. He also heard children telling the same story to scare or prank each other for fun. Some even told them not to mention it, as if it were an urban legend. He found it odd that the people here were treating this as if it had actually happened, and that they were living it off and coexisting with it. Even up until now, it had begun to become a more serious issue. Ah, uh, Nishina. I think you better look up right now, man. Tusi, Daisuki's voice spoke with a sense of urgency and concern this time. It didn't take long for the young sergeant to come to his senses, as he found himself glancing around at the villagers, who were now all solemnly praying to their respective gods. Out of terror, the youngsters had also stopped playing their games and ultimately joined in. What in the world? He thought to himself surrounded by the eerie silence and tension in the air. Eventually, he followed his friend's advice and directed his gaze and attention to the semi-grayish sky, with some of the sun's rays penetrating the forest and the source of it all. Right in the heart of it all is a dark intense crimson beam of light that has thrust into the sky. Hey man, can you see it? I think that's the one that the villagers are somehow referring to. His fellow recon member spoke through the walkie once again. Hey Nishina, do you still copy? Nishina couldn't respond to his comments since awe and shock had overtaken him. He almost dropped his walkie-talkie on the ground since his mind was on one thing. He could sense death in the air and began to get concerned. At that point, the young man was able to say a few words. I hope you guys are safe. The young sergeant stood there, observing a scene that could only be equated to the supernatural. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Not more than any second he had passed through the gate, months ago. The sky had begun to darken slightly, and grayish dark clouds had begun to appear, as if there would be rain in a few minutes. But this did not occur. The sun was still there, having found a spot in the midst of these clouds, and a few of its rays shone down on a specific LAV, a depiction of a battle between light and darkness in the sky. As he finally dropped his wrench to the grassy ground, Al gasped for air. He sighed in relief as he finished the remaining tasks at hand, leaning against the driver's door. He couldn't even feel his own hands due to exhaustion and numbness that had spread all over his back, forcing him to remove his vest and gear that had kept the heaviness in him. It was finished. The man had finally finished repairing the minor issue that had plagued the LAV. He had to admit that he was quite impressed with himself for being able to repair a model that he was unfamiliar with. He did have a slight regret about the procedure. It had taken more than an hour of going back and forth to put the parts back together, and this had caused his entire body to suffer the minor consequences. And he now felt like an old man throwing out some cusses here and there due to the aches he could feel all over his body. It wasn't a great experience to begin with. The fresh air flew by him as a sign of his reward. He'd been trapped in this heat that he couldn't explain, and thankfully, he was able to survive it all and get some well-deserved rest. Al began to wipe the sweat from his forehead. His mind was set on obtaining another leather jug of water that was placed on top of what was remained of a cut-down tree just a few meters away from him. However, the problem that continued to annoy him was the unforgiving body and muscle aches that made its presence known every time he made a single move. As a result, it was that small struggle which brought his morale down and to brink of giving up. Oh come on, why now? Inside his head, the Californian grumbled. As he returned to lean on the LAV, he did not hesitate to utter a defeated sigh. Brian will kill me if he sees me like this. He let another one of his thoughts slip past through. Being one of the guys that was perceived to be quiet, firm, and mentally strong, he did not expect to be placed in a situation where he is actually suffering. He couldn't move his entire body at the moment, except for his hands and arms, which he used to raise up and pretend he had Mr. Fantastic's ability to stretch his arms or even a Jedi's powers, and grab the item that would eventually make him feel better. Al could only close his eyes and fantasize about such a scenario. Unbeknownst to him, a presence had arrived in the area in an unexpected form. While the darkness engulfed his vision, he could hear the sounds of these small footsteps. A short time later, the presence was right beside him. Quay. He immediately opened his eyes, only to be confronted by a familiar tall and massive yellow bird peering down at him. Al, who was startled but quickly regained his composure, tried to sit up straight to see what was going on. Initially, the man was concerned but he soon realized that the yellow bird's intentions were simply to retrieve and deliver the leather jug of water to him. In surprise, he widened his eyes. The old farmer was telling the truth when he said that these birds have the same emotional aspects as humans. These birds truly understand what people are going through. Meanwhile, the chocobo lowered its head as it offered the tired American the leather jug of water, which it carried by slightly biting it with its beak. The yellow bird gave a small grunt afterward. Oh sorry about that, Al said as he grabbed the jug of water and began to drink the fresh liquid to quench his thirst once more. He was overjoyed at the opportunity. He was not expecting this kind of scenario to occur for him. Thanks by the way, I thought I was going to die of thirst but you really saved me there, the man commented, smiling for the first time. Quay Quay, oh really? Thank you so much. I really appreciate your assistance. Fixing this type of model literally gave me a headache. Al scratched the back of his head. Quay. Oh, the others? Well, they are kind of a rush a while ago. There was some trouble back at the village, and they were needed as reinforcements if you know what I mean. Quay Quay. Yeah, I hope things work out for them. Before continuing, the man said. Especially with this land being cursed and all, I'm hoping we can get out of here as soon as possible. He went on to explain. Don't want to be killed by monsters or demonic werewolves you know. He let out a small chuckle. In an unexpected turn of events, Al found himself enjoying the talk since he was anxious to get his views out. The old farmer had returned to the farmhouse to complete a few last-minute tasks, and the man had remained silent for the entire time. 
He had no idea he'd been conversing with a massive yellow bird who, he assumed, couldn't speak any human language all along. Quay, the chocobo said as a sign of a temporary farewell, as the giant yellow bird finally left the area and headed back towards the farmhouse to assist the farmer himself. See you around. The American grinned and waved his hand briefly, having no idea that the bird emitted a light greenish aura, revealing that a certain someone had already placed a kind of magic that eventually raised down the chances of any communication barriers with the man. Ah, what a nice fellow to talk to, he remarked as he sat back down on the LAV once more. However, it did not take long for him to realize that certain truth he had been missing for the rest of the previous conversation. So the man opened his eyes and sat again, with a shock and amused expression on his face. Wait, did I just talk to a bird? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He walked calmly as his identity was slowly revealed. It didn't take long for the girl to recognize him. He had an eerie smile on his lips, tense eyes, as he kept his gaze towards the girl. The blue-haired adolescent quickly grabbed her knife, stood up, and stepped back from the newcomer. As the girl observed the former village official, who did not appear to be what she had expected, he was pale, with blood covering and dripping from his hand and black markings on the bottom of his eyes. Silence befell for a few moments before, the man gave an odd chuckle. You don't need to be so vigilant, so don't worry, I won't hurt or kill you, Marcus explained as he took a few more steps to approach the girl. I merely want to inform you of the obstacles and the dangers which you are going to face. Lele, on the other hand, noticed this kind of transparent aura all over the man after further observation. It didn't take her long to realize that the person in front of her was the spirit of the man, now bound to the curse that afflicted this land. A semi-horrified look slipped across her face, as it could only mean one thing. Sensing some truth in his eyes, the young mage slightly calmed down, though she still kept her guard up, determined to get the whole truth out. What have you done? She asked, wanting to know the truth of it all, her eyes giving a hint of sorrow. I'm sure it's all for the best. Before continuing, the man said, In fact, this land has been missing its final piece, and I'm glad to see it reunited with the place where it began. A perfect ending to this urban legend. You release those demons in this world just to slaughter many innocent lives again. Lole angrily exclaimed, horrified of what the man had done. It won't really do you any good. She added as she wondered the man's true motivation for letting this happen. I should have known. Marcus smiled again. You are mistaken, Lele. Even if I return to Sadera without fulfilling my obligations, my chances of returning to the royal courts have already been diminished. He explained while looking down at his bloodied hand. I begged the old man and even offered safety to his home if he would only cooperate with the plan from the start. The blue-haired mage narrowed her eyes at the mention of that certain place, where her sister currently resided. There was worry that filled her eyes. She had been suspecting it for a long time and that only fueled her own resistance to the idea. Yet, he rudely refused and even tried to harm me and escape, leaving me with no choice. Marcus bitterly said as the man raised his hand to demonstrate what had occurred prior to the explosion. Knowing that it was inevitable, I'd rather move away from this forsaken world than live a life of ridicule and shame. And besides, Sadera can take care of its own affairs. But what did it all cost? The girl replied, seemed to be unfazed and unaffected by the latter's persuasion. She could sense something amiss throughout, the tension in the air rising. Your so-called noble actions. The man didn't say anything this time, but he did give the girl a confident smirk. He was going to stick to his principles and even expressed pride in his actions. No matter how many lives are lost or put at stake, they will all be buried here along with the secrets and the real truth. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
There was this cool and comfortable feeling that had filled him. He was still in the light, suspended, and floating. It was a different experience overall, and in truth, he was just in between worlds. In the midst of the silence and windy echoes, he began to hear the previous chaotic environment around him. A cacophony of gunfire, inhuman screams, and various voices calling out his name. Not long after, he felt an intense heat emanating from the spot where he had been impaled, as well as a force pulling him from behind. He was separating from the light, and by the time he could fully realize what was going on, a female voice suddenly spoke through the light. It's not your time yet. And just like that, the otaku soldier felt the powerful force that pushed him on the chest, and he was suddenly sent away to the farthest ends of the light. The light itself began to fade away, revealing the world once more. As his eyes caught a glimpse of a hand that touched his shoulder and pushed him away from the huge claw and the grasps of the beast. Karada! He heard his name being called again, this time by a very familiar voice, which finally brought his sense back to reality. Moments later he found himself landing on the hard ground as the explosion continued followed by a small shockwave that engulfed the area. He cringed as he felt pain return back on his shoulder once more. Crap! It hurts! He exclaimed from the top of his lungs as the dust and dirt began to fall around him. Even if he was out from the monster's claws, he was still in a bad condition. The area was filled with dirt, dust, and smoke as a result of the small explosion. The scent was a strange combination of burning meat and feces. Shino and Mari were forced to cover their noses to avoid inhaling any of it. Their thoughts are more focused on trying to make sense of what they saw. They just couldn't believe what has transpired in front of them. As if it were to happen only in a dream. The two stood there frozen and couldn't bring themselves to move. Their faces varied from confused, horrified, and to shocked. Slowly, the smoke began to vanish and the visibility was now clearing up to their wishes only to reveal a very disgusting and grotesque scene. Right in the middle where the explosion took place stood the same beast that tried to kill the man. Though, it's been missing half of its entire head, left with only its teeth and jaws which were still hanging and dangling. Apparently, it turned out that the monster didn't fully swallow the whole thing hence its current appearance. A fountain of blood was currently on the top of the exposed jaw. The beast fell down to its knees as if it was finally on the verge of dying, though that was not exactly the case, much to the high hopes of the rest. Higashi, who has finally recovered was the first one to witness its rebirth. He wasn't that far from the exact same spot of the beast. He saw huge chunks of flesh, some a mixture of meat and bones scattered all over the ground. Some managed to land on a portion of his vest, to which he did not become accustomed to. The JSDF soldier almost puked, and it smelled absolutely revolting. From his perspective, it was shit disguised as thick, sticky, and gooey blood. His own thoughts, however, were more focused on what was going on around him at the time. He quickly began surveying the area and immediately spotted his fellow recon member, who was curled up on the ground, holding his shoulder in pain. Takeo. Higashi exclaimed as he recovered his rifle and dashed towards his still-injured otaku friend, ignoring the incapacitated demon. He dashed as quickly as he could and arrived at his destination seconds later. Hey man, are you okay? He inquired as he checked on the young man's condition. When he heard his friend's voice, Karada forced a small smile while still fighting the pain. You took a long time, man. While trembling from the effects of his injuries, he said. Higashi breathed a sigh of relief as the man took a quick glance at the creature before assisting the younger JSDF soldier from the ground. They were soon on their way back to their original path. Meanwhile, Shino and Mari had finally taken note of the unfolding event, much to their amazement that the otaku soldier had somehow escaped the impossible. The two women felt like crying with tears of joy, but their mini-celebration and revelation were cut short. Mari was the first one to shift her focus back towards the beast and notice the immediate changes that had begun to transpire. Her eyes widened in horror afterward. During these occurrences, the beast, which had been seriously injured and damaged by the blast, began to reclaim its life. Blood began to rise and build many muscles and organs from the remains of its exposed lower jaw, while white tissues began to regenerate to form bones and, not long after, a skull. The demon's body gradually rose to its feet, 
while its head began to regenerate at a faster rate. Shino, we gotta do something, Mari worriedly informed the young lady, pointing to the beast's rapidly improving condition. The short-haired JSDF soldier simply nodded in understanding and quickly moved her gaze towards Higashi and Karada, who were doing everything they could to flee the area as quickly as possible. She took a deep breath and surprisingly yelled out, Guys, get your asses here right away. Her abrupt outburst surprised her companion. Mari eventually sighed, recalling how feisty the young woman can be in these kinds of situations. She was a unique of friend, typical Shino just being herself. However, words won't really solve the whole problem as the young woman proceeded to load her rifle once more and headed towards the main area to give protection to the two men. Mari cover me, she exclaimed afterward. The taller JSDF soldier nodded as she too followed behind. Meanwhile, Higashi struggled to carry his friend across the open area. With the beast fastly regaining its former life, it only added to the anxiety of the situation at hand. Another disadvantage was that the young man experienced aches all over his body as a result of being shoved aside and smashing against the wall. There was also a visible bruise on his cheek. He had hoped that the bomb would have killed the opponent, but he was greatly disappointed. As the beast's own regeneration was nearing completion, it could now be heard laughing. By this time, the two men had arrived at the destination and had taken several steps up the very small and short cobbled staircase. At the same time, the beast had fully recovered and had set its sights on them once more. You foolish humans! Whatever you do I cannot be killed! The demon taunted again as it began to charge once more at the two men. He was just a little closer this time than he had been before. But just as the beast was about to strike them with its gigantic claws, he was struck with yet another torrent of bullets, this time aimed primarily at the head. Get behind! Shino exclaimed as she and Mari continued on firing their rifles at the beast to incapacitate him yet again, and also to give the two men time to flee the scene. The beast roared again stumbling backward, though this time was much more annoyed than in pain. The little metals that continued to pierce and penetrate every part of him felt as sharp as needles or even stings of giant bees. As for the two humans he was pursuing, they were able to finally pass through the danger line. Just head straight towards that path. Tuka is waiting for you at the end. Mari exclaimed, before focusing back on firing at the enemy. Got it. Higashi replied, the man still continuing to assist the injured soldier, as they entered the path leading to a specific location. Seeing the incident firsthand, the beast's fury boiled inside him. He sneered at their arrogance, and continued to defy the barrage of bullets flung at him. They're weapons that haven't been seen before. You still believe that you can kill me with your puny magic? He exclaimed, using the strength he was gifted to withstand their attacks. As a result of the firepower, blood began to splatter all over again. Higashi and Karada were almost slipped off their feet as a result of this. Sensing the demon's proximity, the two women took several steps back to maintain their advantage, as range was their only hope of fending off the beast. Unfortunately, their ammo began to run out, and the two were forced to reload again. During those brief moments when the gunfire stopped, the beast took advantage and accelerated his charge. Watch out, Mari yelled out. The two women anticipated it immediately and were able to avoid it before the beast crashed into their former locations, eventually causing the two to go their separate ways. Furthermore, giving their adversary an advantage because it could easily pursue one of them. The demon smiled evilly, knowing how much easier it was for him to capture and devour them one by one. Its only problem was deciding which of the humans he would pursue. Though not long, he did express interest in the short one because he thought she was very unique and had bravery that exceeded his expectations. That certain human might possess the mysterious power that he had not seen before. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
as if it wanted a piece of her but it reminded her of the old perverts who would literally sneak into the middle of a crowded train just to touch and feel her buttocks out of their lust and perverted desires and they all ended up in the hospital currently the tough young lady was fleeing for her life while trying to figure out how to deal with the messed up situation she was in she was no longer confined to a single location as she made her way through the maze-like path. She gasped for air and expressed her dissatisfaction with her gear and vest, which had become a liability by slowing her down due to their heaviness. In addition, her adversary was closing in on her. Every village house or complete structure she passed was instantly destroyed by the beast, who paid no attention as it smashed through the obstacles in its path. Second, its lust and desire grew by the second. Fuck, where the heck am I supposed to head to? Shino complained, treating the current matter at hand as more of an annoying thing than something that should be feared for. Though in the heat of the moment, a faint voice suddenly whispered through her ears, Turn left, the voice instructed, to which the latter had agreed upon out of pure trust. The young lady then widened her eyes and turned her directions to the left. At the farthest point, there was a massive stone arch between two ruined structures. A thick brown rope tied in a specific manner to have someone hanged was left dangling mid-air in the middle of the arch, enough for someone to jump and reach it. Shino forced herself to run as fast she can, passing by a small deserted horse stable. At that moment, she had an idea and realized she could use it to her advantage. It didn't take long for her to arrive at her destination, and just as the beast's claws were about to snare her, the Japanese woman jumped towards the rope and successfully grabbing it in a nick of time. She did, however, drop her rifle on the ground as a result. The demon was taken by surprise by her sudden move. Shino, on the other hand, found herself using the rope to navigate her way, swinging and making a huge U-turn that brought her to the beast's back. Her instincts kicked in, and she pulled her knife from her pack. She landed precisely on its neck and stabbed the beast in the neck with the knife in less than a second. The young woman yelled in rage while the demon roared in pain as it struggled to get her out of his back. Shino tightened her grip and stabbed the beast as hard as she could. Because of her actions, the knife successfully penetrated deep into its flesh with one more stab, and the young woman found herself sliding downwards while the knife, still stuck on the flesh, began to move downwards and sliced its way through. She continued to push and forced enough strength to achieve the damage she wanted to inflict. The young woman landed on the ground and immediately turned to see that her actions had had an effect on her adversary. Her work had been done when the beast's back was split in half, exposing its corrupted insides, organs, and ribs. Sensing the rare opportunity, Shino drew a specific grenade, automatically removing its pin, and threw it like a professional baseball pitcher towards the large hole. The grenade itself entered and became stuck on the massive chunk of flesh. Not a moment too soon, the grenade finally does its work as it released another powerful force which engulfed the recovering demon. This time, it brought fire along with it, as the flames quickly spread all over his back. This is not over yet. It screamed and roared in anger, hating the fact that it got outsmarted by a human and her mysterious weapons. The fact that it could not sense any remnants of fire magic being performed, and the bravery that this woman possessed. It tried to follow the lady once more but couldn't fully charge through since the flames were very unbearable. Shino was able to let out a quick smirk as she immediately grabbed her rifle and proceeded to leave the area before it could fully recover from the lingering fire. Though, before leaving, she gave her own bitter taunt of her own towards the demon. Yippee ka ye mother of asterisk ka xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
time slowed down for them to gather their own composure. It was too late for them to regret what they have been through just now. Hurry, there's no time. The blue orb spoke once more, encouraging the two to continue on. Furuta was the first one to look up and saw a very familiar scene. As the small entity had promised to both of them, they were led back to the main area of the village, particularly the spot where a certain LAV greeted them. The young man's eyes widened as he realized what the blue orb meant by its previous statement. It made sense that such a creature could withstand their firepower. But what if a different weapon, such as their own M2 Browning machine gun, which was attached to the back of that LAV, could do the job? Tomita, the blue orb thing is referring to the LAV. He informed the bigger man, who was still recovering. W what? He replied seemed confused regarding the situation. Furuta slightly sighed. The Browning, it's our best bet here. He rephrased his statement again, with his confidence booming that the hairy bastard could not intake bigger and powerful bullets to its body. Tomita nodded in understanding as he took a deep breath and pushed himself once more just to reach the LAV. Come on fellas, let's go. The blue orb gave another encouragement as it was the first one to reach the LAV itself. Damn, finally, Tomita exclaimed with all his breath as he breath took a small time to give the LV a quick hug. This particular LAV, to which the older Sergeant Kuwahara had been using during the evacuation, had been left alone, undamaged, and in one piece from any violent ongoings through the land. This is far as I can go, the blue orb then said, using its power once more to magically open the driver's door of the LAV, prolonging both of their amazement. Although, there seemed to be a hint of worry in the entity's voice. Thank you very much, but at the very least, could you tell us your name? This time, Furuta was the one who inquired. Everything just happened so quickly that he didn't have time to ask his own personal questions. Unfortunately, the blue orb vanished in a flash of light to attend to other equally important matters, leaving them alone to deal with the next situation, and that their enemy had finally caught up to them. Moments later, three huge trees were instantly brought down simultaneously signaling the arrival of the demon, who was still craving to devour them and fulfill its vengeance. You'll never escape. Oh shit! Both of the men yelled in unison as they began to occupy the LAV as fast as they can, with the Hitoshi entering the driver's seat, while Tomita choosing to hop towards the back of the vehicle in order to control the heavy machine gun itself. Furuta, who fortunately possessed the keys immediately closed the vehicle door and began starting its engines. As for Tomita, the man began to prepare as he brought a certain box to his side, containing the powerful ammo of the attached Browning on top of the LAV. However, their biggest enemy was now time itself, as the beast grinned ferociously and made another charge at the two men. Sensing that they won't be able to fully complete their tasks in a nick of time, Furuta, who brought the engines back to life, immediately stepped on the pedal thus allowing the LAV to burst from its current position before the beast could reach it. Tomita was greeted by surprise as he almost lost his balance if it weren't for himself as he tightly grabbed the supporting metallic stand of the browning. Hitoshi, what the hell? As he found himself on an unexpected roller coaster ride, with the LAV heading in every direction it could find, his thoughts within his mind were instantly translated into actual words. Sorry about that, the young man yelled out, as he began to navigate different streets of the village, in order to evade their enemy, who was still pursuing them up until now. What started as a cat and mouse chase on foot, has now been turned into a literal giant demon werewolf chasing a light armored vehicle at a deserted village in another world. The engine roared louder than the beast as the vehicle smashed through empty wood stalls, sheds, and abandoned wagons. It was literal anarchy as more structures crumbled one by one. The LAV has destroyed more property than its enemy itself. Hitoshi, will you slow down? Tomita, who was in the middle of loading the heavy machine gun with ammo, couldn't help but yell and complain once again. He was also on the verge of getting motion sickness due to the subsequent change of turns and directions. But when he took a glance from behind, the beast was still closely tailing them. Unfortunately, the man didn't hear his voice, so he had no choice but to adapt to the situation at hand. I didn't sign up for this, he secretly thought to himself as he continued to work on loading up the weapon. 
By then the LAV had reached into a more dense area with rows of colonial-like shop houses surrounding them, an advantage that the beast immediately took as it stopped its tracks and jumped towards the roofs in hopes to execute its other plans. Furuta, whose eyes kept looking at the side mirror to keep the enemy in track was greeted by surprise. Damn, where did that bastard go? He gritted his teeth in frustration. The mood had shifted abruptly. The silence returned, but the tension persisted. Both of them have been placed on high alert as they scan their surroundings. The enemy could be lurking in every corner they turn. Hitoshi had no choice but to continue on driving, if he chose to stop. Then it would be all over for them as the enemy could emerge from any spot and quickly surprise and ambush them. Apparently, it didn't take long for the LAV to reach the endpoint of the much wider street, which was revealed to be that of a dead end. That consists more of Shaw houses. The vehicle had still been going at a fast speed. By the time, the LAV was close by, that the enemy made its presence known once more. From the rooftops of the dead end, the beast emerged, with a triumphant smirk. You're all mine now! The beast exclaimed as it immediately jumped from its former position in an attempted to dive and crash onto the metal moving box. The world slowed down once more. Tomita was the first one to notice it and widened his eyes in shock and horror. Furuta! He internally screamed inside his mind, knowing that they were nearing a possible collision course with the demon. Furuta's instincts took over, and he quickly adjusted the clutch and brakes, as well as stepped on a specific pedal. As a result, the LAV began to turn sideways, moving and drifting gracefully to avoid trouble, and as a result, it also produced a large amount of smoke that covered the entire area. Tomita had finally loaded the weapon by this point. It was power over technique. The beast suddenly widened its eyes in surprise as it eventually missed its target by a few inches, landing on the ground instead, facing the LAV, which was now covered in a big smoke. The big thick smoke quickly dissipated, revealing the LAV, with its light on and engines roaring much louder as it faced the creature with unending rage. On top of that, Tomita gripped the handle of the browning, as he prepared to unleash hell. About fucking time, the bigger man exclaimed as he finally pressed the trigger. The beast was initially perplexed but soon realized that the moving metal box was attempting to appear more intimidating, which it eventually dismissed. What it didn't realize was that the oncoming bigger, sharper, and stronger caliber bullets were heading straight for him. Before the beast could fully react, the first several bullets struck him in the chest, instantly piercing through its skin and creating multiple massive holes as blood splattered everywhere. The second wave of bullets managed to sever its arms and legs, and the third wave went for the head, destroying and disfiguring its face until it was unrecognizable. The beast roared in agony proving that even though it was thought to be unkillable, it could still feel pain. The two men's damage had now sent the creature diving into the depths of its memories as it remembered its forgotten past, how it had been brutally tortured by his kind before being executed. However, for the two men, it was not over yet. Furthermore, Furuda immediately pressed the pedal as the LAV accelerated and burst from its current spot directly heading towards the beast. Not more than a second, the vehicle reached its target as the metallic hood smashed into the center of the demon's body, fully crushing it into pieces, severing more of its body parts as its giant paws legs and torso flew into different directions. Only the upper body remained with its unrecognizable head. Pools of blood were now strewn across the main road, reaching the wheels of the LAV. Both Furuta and Tomita could still feel the tensity of the situation as they gave all their might to finally end this so-called torment and nightmare, even though one of the beast's claws was slowly and faintly moving, indicating that no matter what they do, it won't really be killed. Although, the two men still couldn't believe that they managed to survive this ordeal and at least inflict the most inhuman and brutal move they have ever performed. Yet, that they couldn't even describe the actions that they have taken except for a certain word. Fatality. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
she would just grab and head to the giant circular symbol located in the middle of the open area. She did not expect herself to be left alone here. She was a little apprehensive about performing this type of blood ritual for the first time. Of course, she had heard of it before, and she was familiar with many accounts of how the more experienced mages successfully cast this type of magic. And although there were also several individuals who had suffered the consequences of their own hands or legs being cleanly severed, the elf girl did show a little doubt and resistance to this idea. Yet the blue-haired teen was just too persuasive and stood with her own plan. It was literally the only way they could help the men in green, who they assumed are currently searching for their missing comrade. And the young mage elected to proceed north to the village plaza, where she would draw another symbol that could serve as a backup if everything else failed. Despite her concerns that she should not go there alone, she proceeded, convinced that the plan would work no matter what horrors awaited her beyond. She had never seen such bravery in a human before. As time continued to pass by, Tuka could feel the drowsiness catching up to her. She really wanted to take the available time to take a nap for herself. It seemed that this process will take more than just an hour to complete. She couldn't help but yawn. She did resist her urges, but the temptation was just too strong. The girl could feel her eyes slowly shutting down, and for the first time, she actually felt comfortable and all she needed was a soft and squishy pillow. Moments passed she was already on the verge of snoring, though if it weren't for a voice that called her name. TK, the elf girl jerked awake and opened her eyes. She quickly took up her knife and assumed a defensive stance. She looked around, only to notice the men in green rushing towards her location. Only that there was a problem that she had taken notice of. She widened her eyes in surprise when she saw that there were only three of them who had made it to the area, and she immediately rushed to them. The two individuals turned out to be Higashi and the injured Karada, who had barely made it through the journey. The elf girl showed concern for the man that she had accidentally flipped over prior to all of this happening, by the time she saw him. By the gods, are you all right? Tuka asked as the rest placed the injured man under the shade of a certain nearby big tree. The young man holding his bloodied shoulder as he tried not to show any signs of him in agony or pain. In fact, the man did let out a few chuckles and a smile. Yeah, don't worry, it's just stabbed wound on my shoulder. Karada replied, forcing himself to grin. Where's Shino by the way? He added, giving more concern to the young woman. This is the serious man. You barely even escaped the explosion and that hairy bastard. Higashi spoke this time around albeit giving his friend a scold. W where's Lady Shino and Mari? The elf girl slightly stuttered and asked, to which the older man in green struggled to answer. Higashi nervously scratched the back of his head. Well, Mari-san and Shino-san are still dealing with the demon werewolf. I'm not sure if he was about to finish his sentence when a familiar voice suddenly interrupted him. Higashi, all their attention shifted towards a certain individual who turned out to be Mari herself, holding on to the tree and gasping for her breath. A small wave of confusion had filled their minds as they tried to comprehend the panic expression of the young woman. As for the medic herself, she didn't reply right away except raising her hand to point in a certain direction. Just then the atmosphere began to change as they could hear a horse's steps and the smell of burning flesh. A light suddenly emerged from a distance, and they were all greeted by an unexpected surprise. Guys, I'm bringing the fucking party to you now. Shino exclaimed with all her might as she pushed the horse that she had stumbled upon on an abandoned stable while being chased by the same beast she had a deal with earlier. She thought she was already passed by that point. A big mistake on her side. Luckily, life was forgiving this time so it gave her the only saving grace in the form of that horse. The beast itself was in a rage as it dashed its way to devour the young woman to exact its revenge. The only difference was that the creature was covered in huge flames as a result of the grenade that exploded on its back. It now looked more like the stuff of nightmares that everyone would often see in a fantasy horror game. Seeing this ongoing trouble, took a quickly rush towards the top of the circle, though not before eyeing Higashi to come along. Sir, I need your assistance for this. The elf girl exclaimed, much to the confusion of the man. Wait, what am I supposed to do? The JSDF soldier widened his eyes, 
suddenly taken by surprise that he now had a role in this kind of stuff. Without any hesitation, the man left the injured Karata Tamari, as he rushed himself towards the weird symbols. Once there, the man gave a worried face, shifting his gaze between the elf girl and the oncoming threat. Furthermore, he had not participated in any occult or magical activities, further exposing his own lack of knowledge. Um, Tuka, I really don't what I'm gonna do here, I mean. The man trailed off once he saw the girl's serious expression. Okay, I'll do what you say. Tuka sighed but gave a small smile of comfort and encouragement. All right, if you have a knife of your own, please bring it out quickly, she said calmly but seriously. Higashi nodded, as he immediately drew out his own combat knife. What now? He asked again. The elf girl did not reply this time but instead brought both of her hands, one hand holding the knife and the other fully relaxed as if it were ready to be wounded at will. Realizing what the girl had meant, Higashi could feel his hair standing up, and for the first time, he expressed his own hesitation. Hold on a sec. I'm not going to cut my wrist like that. The man slightly protested, but in truth, he was just afraid of seeing more blood again. It was a hidden phobia that he had been managing all these years. Tuka noticed this and eventually deduced the man's problem. Just wound your finger or palm. We need more blood to speed up this magic ritual. The girl responded, her voice slightly irritated. Please! Time was running out for them, as the trees finally started crashing down, and the demonic beast on fire was now closing up to them. The decision was on the man himself. Fortunately, Higashi was able to gather enough courage and with just one simple glance at the elf girl's eyes, signaling the start of the ritual. Now, Tuka exclaimed as she and the man in green finally wounded their palms, and their own respective blood dropped simultaneously on the ground. And with that, the main symbol and other incantations suddenly glowed brightly, as the magic began to take effect. Get out of the circle now, Tuka instructed. Both of them left the circle as quickly as possible, and by the time Shino arrived, the young woman had quickly controlled the horse as it galloped as high as it could just to pass over the circle, and when the beast followed suit and jumped just in time to reach the center of the circle, the magic had reached its peak, and the circle produced a bright powerful magical barrier that beamed through the sky, with its edges reaching and cutting a large portion of the beast's tail, and eventually trapping it inside. Higashi and Mari were left in awe as they finally got to witness the kind of magic in this world being performed in front of their eyes. It really did look like the type of magic they have seen in every fantasy film. It looked more majestic than they had thought. The demon's eyes widened as the magical barrier triggered some of its memories to resurface, particularly the day when a band of brave individuals worked together to seal them away using eerily similar techniques to those used by these humans. No! Release me from this cursed barrier. It continued to release its demands while still, the fire was still burning on its back. It was now desperate and suffering for the first time. In your dreams a asterisk coal, Shino, who unloaded from the horse, took the time to approach the creature and released her own frustrations at it. You freaking pervert. Got the guts to eat my ass so badly? Instead of being provoked, the beast was filled with confusion, not understanding what the human woman had said, while the rest just gave a cringe. You think this is all over? Even if you trap me in this puny barrier, you humans will never escape this land. As much as the burning beast tried to inflict terror and intimidation, the creature had no chance of escaping the powerful barrier that imprisoned him. Shino, for her part, ignored the beast's ramblings, taking a deep breath to finally release the pressure that had been building up inside her. Surviving and dealing with supernatural demonic werewolves like this was not an easy task. She was at least glad for overcoming this. The rest had the same thoughts. According to Mage Girl, this barrier is strong enough to keep even the stronger types of dragons and demons. Her thoughts eventually shifted to Karada, by the time she laid sight of him, quickly rushing to his side. Crap! Karada are you alright? The young woman expressed her own concern with the latter, who was now eventually on the verge of going into a deep slumber. Mari who was still treating the otaku soldier's wounds flashed a small smile. He'll be all right, Shino, don't worry, she assured her friend. The busty young lady sighed in relief as she heard her statement. 
She felt a twinge of regret for not being there in time to save the man. She considered herself to be a member of the third recon family. She had every right to be relieved to see the otaku alive and well. Higashi also joined the scene as the three recon members finally reunited together. Though there was one thing that the man had noticed, and that is the horse that his fellow recon member had brought. Um, Shino, I was just wondering, but where the heck did you get the horse from? He asked, pointing to the brown creature itself, which was resting from a nearby tree. Shino simply raised both eyebrows and gave a lazy shrug. Got it from an abandoned barn while I was running, she said. Okay. Higashi slightly gave a puzzled look. The busted young woman shrugged yet again. Lucky I guess? Took a flash to small smile seeing the genuine reunion. Though her own celebrations would be cut as her mind quickly reminded her of the blue-haired teen. Oh no, Lele. The elf girl immediately dashed and left the scene in order to save her friend. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Spirits weren't supposed to have the ability to influence the course of history. Lele had been skeptical throughout this time. The girl doubted the man's spirit, who kept discussing his own actions as if it were the crowning achievement for the village, blurting out so-called secret information that sounded too far-fetched. Even in death, the man retained his delusional character. She already had an idea of what the man had done when he activated the scroll. She just had that feeling since the beginning. Does she really need to bring that question out right now? It's all up to you, Lele. Marcus flashed a smile. He had apparently told the girl everything that was needed to know or she should know, that even her teacher would express his own guilt regarding it. To believe or not to believe, it will happen, no matter what. It was the root cause of why vengeance was prevalent in this whole continent. A never-ending cycle. I'm afraid, this will be the last time, you'll see me the man said, expressing his own sadness. I wish I could tell you more about it, but you'll learn the truth soon enough. The wind grew stronger as the spirit showed signs of finally fading away, but before he could fully leave, he finally reached the blue-haired teen and placed a hand on her shoulder. That's if you could survive this nightmare. In just a few moments, the spirit of Marcus vanished into thin air, leaving the girl alone once more. But at the same time, a heavy and overwhelming presence had finally arrived in the area, and it was just right behind her. Lele's body froze as she noticed a gigantic shadow looming above her, and not long after that, a faint aggressive sound resonated through her ears, followed by a huge sharp dirty claw that was slowly positioned near her throat, and followed by what appeared to be an evil chuckle. I could devour you right now girl, but Marcus is just persuasive as he is, even in spirit. The demon spoke as he finally revealed his identity. Lele remained in the same position, as any of the slightest mistakes or moves could result in death. Though, she was taken by surprise as it turned out that the whole thing was actually not an illusion, but the real deal. What is your true purpose here? She asked before adding, Why are you murdering innocent people all these years? She demanded. There was slight silence that followed. The beast had not heard such questions in centuries. Though, it chose to respect the girl's wishes before its main decision to kill her right away. Vengeance. It simply said, triggering memories from the past. Once you have been consumed by it, you'll never go back to your old life. The beast explained, expressing this small sadness. No matter how good your intentions are or your principles, you'll never escape this kind of imprisonment. The villages that have settled here, and to the people that ventured in this land, they don't know what true pain is and they just endure it for another hundred of years to come. The rage was returning again, the intensity in the air had risen, and the time has come for blood to be spilled, and the legend to continue. And as for you child, you'll be a part of this suffering. As the beast proceeded to make his move in order to slit the girl's throat, the latter quickly reacted, drawing out some kind of glittering dust from her small pouch, as she threw it all out onto the ground. A large smoke filled that certain spot, as the young mage vanished from the creature's grasps and in quickly appeared on the other side of the circle. As for the beast, it was caught by surprise and attempted to lunge at the girl. Lele, who successfully had performed a small improvised teleportation magic, immediately brought her knife and her hand to the incantations, illustrated on the ground, and she quickly wounded her palm, causing blood to be released and after that, 
she brought that bloodied palm of hers by smashing it into the ground colliding with the symbols. The magic had taken effect as the circle began to glow brightly. Afterwards, a beam of powerful magical energy shot through the sky. The demon widened his eyes in shock as it tried to escape the so-called trap that the girl had set up. It did manage to evade it but as a consequence, the beam had severely eviscerated both of its hands. Clever girl. It commented as the beast was now determined to even the score. It did not scream or roar in pain, as it only saw his hands regenerate at a faster pace. As for Lele, her chances of reaching the village ruins were reduced, so she quickly went to her backup plan and began to cast several spells. Once the beast had his hands regenerated, the ground began to shake on where he was standing, and not too long. Huge giant roots of trees began to emerge and attempted to bind and tie the beast. However, the enemy quickly anticipated it, and it used its strength to break free. It quickly proceeded to charge at the girl once more, who then cast another spell. The wind grew stronger in one area as a couple of mini tornadoes formed in front of it and it collided with the beast, trapping him in that position, preventing him from moving forward, and delaying its goal yet again. Lele proceeded to run towards her destination again, with brewing confidence that the spell she had cast would give her time to fully escape. But things didn't fully turn out as she had planned it to be. You are persistent, I am impressed. The demon evilly chuckled as it raised its right hand and gripped it to summon more of his little henchmen. The young mage suddenly stopped her tracks as the ground in front of her erupted, with another demonic wolf emerging from under. The same scenario happened in nearby surroundings as three more made their presence known, and quickly charged at the girl. There is no escaping now. Lele was quickly placed into a major disadvantage as all four beasts went to charge at her at the same time. A girl a bit surrounded ponder on what she should do next and as the enemies were reaching him something had interrupted their attacks. The ground shook again as giant sharp rocky stones burst out from under, quickly impaling the four wolf beasts at the same time. What? Impossible! The demon exclaimed, who also proceeded to dash at the girl again at a blinding speed, in an attempt to catch her off guard, ignoring another powerful presence that had entered the scene. The ground erupted again as another giant boulder blocked his path when he was about to reach the girl at point-blank range, sending him a few distances away. Run Lele! A familiar voice was then heard. The young teen shifted her attention towards a certain sage. Kato had finally arrived. The old man having recovered much earlier was in time to prevent the beast from catching up to his student. His staff glowed as he began to cast multiple spells a wave of energy manifesting in front of him that directly hit the demon, further losing his control. As for Lele, she paid heed to the old man's advice and proceeded to head towards the village hall ruins as fast as she can, where the source of its power was located. The battle continued to rage on between the old sage and the main demon. Kato seized every opportunity now that its focus had shifted to him, and he began to manipulate his surroundings. His staff glowed once more as he cast the spell that lifted the beast into the air. Meanwhile, the old man cast another spell, causing a portion of massive rock-like spikes to form on the ground. After that, the old sage hurled the beast at the rocky spikes with all his might, smashing the creature back and forth. Kato knew that this would eventually waste more of his mana, but more practical compared to his original plan on summoning an earth golem to combat the demon by doing so that it would fully drain him once again, so he had to make use of every aspect of the environment he was in. Although, the beast had its own plan as darkish violet flames filled one of its hands, and by the time he was about to collide with the giant rocks, he used his strength mixed with fire magic to hit the rocks as hard as he can, resulting it to be smashed into bits. It's that all you got. He gave a menacing grin as he continued to charge at the old man with blinding speed, covered in blood, but still wanting to get the task done. Kato proceeded to his next plan as he attempted to gather enough mana to bring forth lightning, but unfortunately, the beast was too fast. So the old sage had no choice but cast the spell to form a magical sphere magical barrier around himself, and braced for impact. Just as he expected, the beast collided with the barrier yet again, using the same brute force and dark fire magic that quickly dispelled the barrier. Sending the old man away from a few distances, 
to where he accidentally let go of his staff during the midair. The old sage crashed and landed on the ground in pain. A few moments later, the enemy proceeded to approach the old man, and by the time he had reached him, it gave an arrogant laugh of its own. Your efforts are noble old man, but sometimes, everything has an end. The beast taunted once more as he went on to grab the old sage by the collar, and as he was about to lay his claws on him, he suddenly felt heaviness on top of his shoulder. A certain elf girl had managed to sneak around undetected, and as she stood on top of the beast's shoulder, she raised both her hands towards the grim sky and uttered the word, Medvedi Yubit. Soon after, a strike of lightning came down from the clouds as it merged with her hands forming some kind of yellow bolt. Tuka immediately used that bolt and stabbed the creature on the back of its neck, spreading the powerful sparks and electricity throughout its body. The beast finally roared in pain. It forced itself to grab the elf girl with its own bare hand and tossed her towards debris, crashing into it. Tuka grimaced in pain for the first time, as she unexpectedly drove the beast's attention towards her. The demon had set his sights on the injured elf, but as he was about to charge at his new prey, a small gush of wind passed by him, and by the time he turned to his right, he caught sight of a strange small green object followed by an arrow with a silver tip heading straight for him. The small green object and the arrow collided with each other causing yet another big explosion right in front of his face. The demon was sent several distances away, with a now severely damaged face that started to regenerate once more. Kato and Tuka were caught by surprise as they turned to face familiar faces. Tuka, Mr. Kato, Sergeant Kuwahara and Hotter had arrived just in time to save the elderly man. When they saw the current situation, both of them acted immediately, with the Japanese sergeant throwing a grenade and the elf man firing another arrow at the same time, which was a suitable combination for stunning and incapacitating their enemy once more. Tuka nearly burst into tears while Kato sighed in relief seeing the two men alive and well. Sergeant Kuwahara quickly rushed to the old mage while Hada rushed to his injured daughter. Sorry, we're kinda late Mr. Kato, the Japanese sergeant said as he helped the old sage recover his staff and himself from the ground. Thank you sir, but we need to help my student, she needs more time to disable the scroll and its power, the old man explained encouraging the rest to fight the beast in order for the girl to reach the source in time. He forced himself to stand and headed to confront the enemy again. Are you alright Tuka? Hada worriedly asked. I'm sorry we didn't arrive in time, but I'm glad you're safe. The man expressed a sigh of relief for her daughter. Father, the scroll must be destroyed. The elf girl exclaimed, desperately wanting to head to the village ruins. I know, Hada nodded and replied, bringing his eyes towards the source though his mind focused towards the current enemy. As for the demon, his own rage had reached higher levels but at the same time, it took delight that more prey had entered the area. Knowing that these individuals would be capable of standing toe to toe against him, he eventually decided to enact his final move. As his horribly damaged face began to regenerate, the beast widened its eyes as it began to gather all the power that he had accumulated all over the countless years of slaughter. The ground began to tremble once more, which immediately alerted the others. Moments later, a massive demonic hand burst and ejected from the soil, followed by ten more of the same kind. The demon laughed, commanding the giant specter-like demonic hands to crush his shocked enemies. You will all die here! XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
she stood firm and trusted the blue orb out of familiarity, and headed towards the source. Go and end this nightmare, it said, encouraging the girl to continue on with her journey. Despite her confusion and the questions she wanted to ask about the entity's identity, the young mage continued on. The mysterious blue orb also accompanied her throughout the journey prolonging the energy barrier surrounding the blue-haired teen. If it weren't for its intervention, the girl might have already died for absorbing this many impurities. A few steps away to finally end the nightmare that plagued this land. Not long after, Lele reached the dark red beam of energy and effortlessly pushed her way through, finally coming face to face with the source. The girl now held the scroll which was revealed to be completely intact throughout this time. Lele kneeled down on the ground as she brought her knife once more. Sensing that she still had some of her mana left within her, she immediately channeled the remaining mana through the knife, causing it to be engulfed with light blue flames. With that, she brought the fiery knife down and pierced the middle of the scroll, damaging the main symbol. From that point, the young teen began to recite a prayer that would signal the end of a curse. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. It was that specific dark magic that became the turning point of the battle. Once the main demon had gathered all the precious souls that were killed in this land, it grinned as with its power. It began to summon a terrifying entity from the deep recesses of the underworld itself. The ground erupted once again and came out scores of gigantic hands with massive sharp claws that fully resembled the main demon's hands. These dark otherworldly hands began to do their bidding as they attempted to reach and crush the ones that continued to resist him. Kato raised his staff and immediately cast another spell, as yet another magical barrier appeared around them, protecting them from being grabbed and ripped to shreds by these massive demonic hands for the time being. Sergeant Kuwahara's jaw almost dropped having to witness this kind of horrifying monstrosity. This was already beyond his power, to begin with. He doubt that his own grenades or rifle could resist it. Whoever thought that this demon would have the power summon a creature from the underworld? Kato, who was just beside the Japanese man, had said, We cannot fully defeat this without the help of Emroy or his apostle. The old man added, as he secretly whispered a certain name, We need to get out here quickly. Hodder stressed the fact that the barrier was only temporary and had kept reminding the rest, as he carried an injured Tuka on his back. Despite her protest not to leave and to save her blue-haired friend. Damn it! Kato cursed for the first time in his life, as the dark energy began to overwhelm him. He was not prepared to face someone who had somehow managed to summon a type of creature that only belonged to the deep depths of the beyond. The barrier was slowly breaking away. At that very moment, one of the enormous demonic hands appeared from the ground just a few meters in front of them, smashing the barrier and finally breaking it. Its claws quickly tightened again, and its size increased, and it proceeded to crush all of them. However, at the same time, their world began to slow down as a certain dark smoke-like aura began to manifest. By then, as quick as their eyes could notice a silhouette suddenly passed above them and that figure wielded an absurdly massive weapon. In a blink of an eye, the demonic hand suddenly found itself being instantly severed and destroyed disintegrating in just mere seconds as the figure headed towards the main enemy. No matter what these creatures attempted to do, they all fall one by one to this powerful presence that moved so gracefully. No theatrics. No showboating. Only complete annihilation. The main demon was confused and frustrated at first, but soon as he finally caught sight of its identity, it widened its eyes in horror and shock as it immediately recognized the presence it was dealing with. And at the same time, that this was all happening, a teenage girl began reciting a certain short prayer. In the name of the sun god, I pray that this land be fully delivered from the curse that has afflicted it for hundreds of years. The power of the scroll began to dwindle, and as the summoned creatures from the underworld were all vanquished leaving the beast to finally see and recognize the presence that approached him. The massive ghost-like halberd, the dark aura that surrounded her, and the powerful ethereal eyes were enough for him to fear. I pray in the name of Emmer, that these demons would finally see the light and be purified by your oracle. The presence had finally taken shape, and revealed to be the angel of death herself, Rory Mercury. The demon muttered aloud as the massive halberd finally reached him, plunging through his shoulder and into his chest, 
before he could react to it. His eyes widened as he fell down to his knees, still staring at the demigoddess herself. Furthermore, the dark red energy beam emanating from the village hall had finally vanished from behind. Silence befell for a few moments. The demon was struck with confusion. You should have gone for the head, he told the black-haired lady, citing one mistake she had supposedly committed. Rory simply smiled. Oh, that's not part of my plan at all. The young lady spoke as her weapon began to shine brighter summoning the power of her god, and moments later she yanked the gigantic halberd from the demon's body, causing a huge deep wound. At the same time, it finally unleashed the hundreds of souls in the form of this luminous blue-green essence that the beast had taken for centuries, out of him and towards the recovering sky. Furthermore, a massive tremor and shockwave had erupted and burst through the wreckage of the town hall, signaling the end of a powerful curse. The demon roared in pain. He could feel his power gradually disappearing. His form was slowly changing, as he himself was being engulfed by the same ethereal essence. The once hellish sky began to clear, the dark clouds slowly fading away, and the sun finally able to show itself fully. The thick fog had finally disappeared, revealing what is left of the village, damaged houses, debris everywhere, and a somewhat sorrowful image of what was once a lively scene. During that time, Yuji, Itami, the American Rangers, and the rest of the team had finally arrived at the place, emerging from the forest alive and well with them riding the chocobos. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
but he was nevertheless shocked at what was happening to him at the time. The reality had struck him, shocked by the cruel crimes he had committed with his fellow companions, and a great deal of remorse had finally overwhelmed his mind. Tears slowly formed in his eyes as he started to let his emotions take over, and for the first time, the man cried. I was not aware of what I was doing during those times, I devoured women and children, and killed their husbands for the sake of my own demons that I couldn't even control. His lips began to tremble as he looked down. He continued to release his emotions, repenting for the sins he had committed. I only wanted justice for what these people have done to my wife and children. The man then looked up again to face the oracle. Even if I am condemned to suffer the consequences for my actions in the afterlife, it would be alright for me, as long as my family will get the peace they deserved. He explained, expressing a sad smile, as he appeared to be open to accept whatever fate he may be fell unto. Please forgive me, great oracle. He concluded his statement as he handed the young girl the final judgment in his case. For Rory's part, the young lady smiled as she really did understand what the man had gone through and suffered. People like him were just victims and he didn't deserve that kind of punishment. It was a curse that fully took him away from what he used to be. She felt sorrow in him instead of vengeance and anger. She simple nodded and placed a hand on the man's shoulder and said, You don't need to worry my dear. You will see your family once again and be with them in peace in the next world. Along with the souls that continued to emerge, the man finally smiled as he fully embraced the blessing that has been given to him. His whole body slowly fade away as he was now becoming part of the ethereal essence that rose up towards the now beautiful sky. He finally found the peace he had been searching for all these years. It was a magnificent spectacle, as the souls of the past were finally laid to rest and had found their own peace once and for all. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the young mage who had emerged from the ruins as she limped her way towards the rest. She could feel tiredness taking over and she was on the edge of falling if it hadn't been for her blonde elf buddy, who was able to catch her in time. What happened out there? Are you alright? Did you get hurt? Tuka peppered the teen with her own worried questions. Without realizing it, she was channeling her late mother's characteristics through her. Yeah, I'm fine. Lele was able to muster more strength to speak before succumbing to her own exhaustion. She collapsed on her friend's arms, releasing all the negative tension, stress, and anxiety that plagued her all throughout. Her task was finally done. Oh, how she wished this was all just a dream and this nightmare didn't exist. She didn't want to think about anything, other than taking a long nap for the rest of the day. She'd had enough of magic, folklore, myths, ghosts, dragons, and demons for now. Overall, she was relieved that it was all over, and for the time being, she will enjoy the rest of these tranquil hours and simply be a normal teenage girl from this point on. Seeing that everyone was safe, and especially her father figure, the girl finally smiled after all the things she had been through. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The scenes are close and personal to the perspective of the characters. Fight scenes are simplified. Regarding the magic aspect, the blue orb thing is loosely inspired by a scene in Dark Deception Chapter 4, where the protagonist encounters a blue orb spirit that helped him escape from the enemy. For Rory's entrance and along with the prayer that Lele was reciting, I'm not sure from where the inspiration came from is pretty vague for me, but I did find the dynamic of it pretty cool. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. And also please go easy on me since I'm not a member of any military organizations. 20. Arc 1. Code of Village Finale. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1. Lands of Rodinius. Code of Village Arc Finale. Be careful with those books. Those are very rare. Apologies, Mr. Kato. That's a very precious antique chest. Please be careful. Will do, Mr. Kato. It was a bustling scene that was confined to a single location. It was, in fact, the first time she had had the cabin so crowded in the entire year she had resided here. Countless tables, drawers, cupboards, and even pillow cushions were arranged in a train-like formation towards the exit door. The thought itself and ongoing scenario still continued to entertain the young mage. She was still baffled by the fact that their small home still managed to survive the previous ordeal not long ago. Heck, it even survived the natural calamities that plagued the land. Despite the scope of the destruction overall, the house was still there, with the final purpose of sheltering and providing them the last bastion before they could fully transfer into another place. Lele forced a defeated grin. I guess you've won the bet, Master Kato. The old man had been correct all along. He had been there from the start, even before the house was finished. He had put his heart and soul into it, and he treated the small cabin as if it were his permanent home, despite the fact that he was constantly on the move and traveling to different places. Thank you very much for your assistance, men in green. The elderly man smiled and bowed as a sign of respect. These people were just naturally helpful. They'd done a lot in the last several hours, and he wasn't sure how he'd repay them in return. The old sage noticed her student wandering around the area as the moving process continued, and he smiled. Deep down, he knew it would be difficult for her to leave the place where she had spent a long time, and it occurred to him that the girl needed more time to deal with her own situation. It was for the best, so he left her be for a while. The teen took in her surroundings as the last stack of books and other little furniture were eventually removed from their appropriate sections and carried outside to be loaded into the wagon itself. Some of the guys in green, as well as some of the village men, were assisting with the shifting procedure. It was the first time she had seen so many people supporting her and her teacher. Usually, it was just the two of them or a friend would take care of moving stuff whenever Kota Village moved into a new place and such and this time, it was free of charge. Even if the people lived in these lands in peace, they still had to make something out of it, even if it was the smallest thing. She couldn't remember how many pouches of silver coins her teacher had already given her because it was difficult and time-consuming to move all of these important books, documents, altars, antique objects, artifacts, and so on. As the last of the furniture had been moved out, it was only the girl herself who was left behind, in the now empty cabin. Lele had developed the habit of wandering around the empty premises whenever they were about to leave, and this wasn't the first time. With the exception of slight creaks from the wooden floor, there was nothing but silence. The adolescent began in her room and worked her way out until she reached the farthest reaches of the cabin. There were plenty of memories that had been created in a span of just a year. In fact, these memories and moments were created in the midst of that silence. Hardly, her teacher and she ever interacted in a more genuine way since the reality of the situation had taken control. She even recalled how the old man never left his workstation just to produce more maps for the visiting travelers and merchants. She understood that they needed food on the table, but the main goal of improving and honing her magic skills and knowledge had been neglected. The main reason why she had this little disappointment that continued to stay within her. Although, it doesn't change the fact that she still loved the old man as a father figure, and that will forever remain. Finding herself in the living room again, a memory flashed before her eyes. 
The young teen looked back and saw herself playing different board games with her teacher, and even going through numerous debates tackling topics such as magic, social issues, and even the myths and legends of the new world. It was the only time they were together, as a student and teacher, and as well as daughter and father figure. A small tear fell from the girl's eyes, and before she knew it, she was now crying. She fell to her knees in the middle of the empty living room, and just let it out there from that point on. She was finally able to release all of the emotions that she had kept inside. Despite the fact that she was the type of girl who would always hide them whenever she had an argument with the old man, or having the worst day. The drive and motivation to excel just like her big sister almost took the entirety of her life as a normal teenage girl. In that one year, she learned how to take care of herself, how to carry herself in terms of her powers as a student mage, and finally, how to perceive life as this wonderful gift that should always be treasured. For the first time, she felt grateful for everything, and it really opened her eyes to a whole new perspective. Lala, it was the voice of her teacher who has been calling her from the wagon. It did, indeed, break her thoughts, and before long, she realized the wagon was ready and waiting for her. They were finally leaving their old home. The girl stood up again, not in a hurry, but with excitement, she then wiped the tears from her eyes and took a deep breath. She finally let out a genuine smile as she entered the light shining from the exit door, not as the same girl she had been before, but as a new leaf. X sex 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 She never felt so happy to finally see the beautiful sky once again. The hellish landscape that had taken over during their previous battles with demons had stayed in her mind. It was already an accomplishment for her to be able to finally overcome that phase, and now she was in the process of recovering and recuperating. During these times, she would frequently find herself in the shade of a particular tree the only place where she could find her own peace. As she tried to recollect her senses, she gazed out towards the wonders of the countryside in front of her. The elf girl was still shaken by the prior events, and thus she failed to forget the horrors she had experienced. She had never encountered such a powerful force that came directly from the depths of the underworld. It was the first time she'd seen what dark magic could do, let alone that a cursed person had the ability to perform such feats. Her forte was not archaic magic that required blood. When her blue-haired friend pressed and convinced her to perform the ritual, she had no choice but to comply, or else they would never see the light of day again. She was afraid to inflict pain on herself. One of the main reasons why she attempted to master the art of evading an enemy's attack or often refused to perform an important ritual that requires her own blood. That kind of fear stemmed from the last days of her late mother. Seeing her weakened and in a state of suffering had devastated her, and until now she couldn't get herself passed by that mental struggle, the pain that her late mother had suffered. She was afraid of it, and it didn't take long enough for her to experience it firsthand during the battle, and that she almost got herself killed because of that. Tuka hugged herself tighter. Her emotions saw this as an opportunity to grow, but she couldn't bring herself to face the changing reality since the day of her mother's passing. Every time she mustered the courage to confront her demons, she would always give up halfway through, and she would restart from the beginning until she finally reached that point, and much to her many disappointments, she is unable to face them. It became an endless cycle for her. As time passed, the wind grew stronger. Tuka didn't really know if she could stand up and continue on with the recent ongoings. For now, she only wanted to remain in this kind of solitude though that was until a shadow and a presence arrived. I always knew that you would be here. The voice struck her ears and the elf girl opened her eyes. She then looked up to see a familiar face and a smile. Papa, she muttered to herself. Hodder, in fact, had a tough time locating his daughter throughout the village, though he went along with his own instincts and discovered the type of place where the latter would always spend her time with. He smiled. I thought you were with the others on the field but my heart was right all along, he went on to explain. You could call it a coincidence, but when I first met your mother, she was in a similar situation as this, he said. That particular time was fondly remembered by the elf man. It was true love at first sight, and he wondered why a lovely young lady would be in the most remote parts of the forest. 
And it took him a long time to figure that out until the realization itself came to him. Elrina was just a mysterious individual, and he considered her as this glowing hope which helped him find his own path. At the mention of her late mother, Tuka remained quiet, though she let out a small smile and slowly nodded. However, her inner struggle continued as she went back into her thoughts once again. In truth, she really did want to talk to anyone at the moment, fearing that they would see the vulnerable side of her, even if it's her father. The silence continued to strengthen. Hodder simply sighed but smiled, as he took the available open space and sat down beside her daughter under the shade of the tree. What a beautiful view! I had no idea a Chocobo farm had already been established in this area. He made a remark in an attempt to lighten the mood. You know, riding one of those giant birds was one of my and your mother's childhood dreams, but... He paused, remembering how life had not been kind to them. It's quite costly to acquire them, let alone pay for a single ride around the fields. The elf girl remained silent, not saying anything. When he returned his gaze to her, the situation had changed for him. It was at this point that he finally felt the sorrow and struggle that had been lurking deep within him. As it turned out, it wasn't just his daughter who was struggling to face her demons, but him as well. For the first time in years, he was able to confront old memories that he had tried to suppress for so long. Every memory from the days of a once joyous family to his wife's death and the subsequent rocky and hectic life that the two continued to live through flashed right before him. His gaze returned to his daughter, who was now staring at him straight in the eyes. Hodder sighed again as he gave her a comforting warm smile, sensing that she was on the verge of tears. His instincts kicked in, and he cradled his daughter in his arms. Not more than a second, Tuka finally burst into tears as she accepted her father's embrace. From that then on, the elf girl was finally able to let out the emotions inside. I can't do it anymore, Tuka wept. I just want everything to go back to how it was. She kept pleading and pleading, wishing that the gods would send her back to that forgotten time. Hodder could do nothing but listen and console his daughter. He couldn't make it up to her, no matter how badly he wanted to. All he could do was watch and sympathize, and a tear fell from his eye in the midst of it. I wish mother was here. I wish all of this did not happen. How she truly wanted all this to be just part of a dream. All these years since the tragic and abrupt moment had struck their lives, she had not moved on from that, and it was very difficult for her to keep that hidden, and even in the most daring times of her life, her body trembled as she felt this particular weakness. I was devastated when your mother passed, Hodder spoke up. It was as if the world had come to an end for me there. He then looked down. I thought drinking more booze and getting drunk would make the pain go away, but I was wrong. The man explained his voice tinged with regret. It only made matters worse. He continued, and that fueled the worst side of my personality. He remembered the woman's beautiful smile. I'm sorry for not being there for you. The man apologized from the bottom of his heart. I'm also sorry for not being the father I was supposed to be. The tears kept falling, and before he knew it, he was crying as well. I couldn't keep her promise. It was at that moment when Tuka came to the realization that her father indeed had changed for the better. A surprised expression crept upon her face as she looked up again and at the same time, her father gazed upon her eyes. And in a surprising twist, Tuka had gathered enough courage and let out a few words as he looked straight into the man's eyes. I forgive you. Hodder's heart had warmed hearing his daughter's statement. He let out a smile as he pulled the girl into a fatherly embrace. A gust of wind passed by them and a warm and comforting presence engulfed their surroundings. As father and daughter were able to finally release their emotions and burdens, they finally reconciled. Their attention shifted towards the vast countryside with new hope in their hearts and minds. Unbeknownst to them, a beautiful young elf woman's spirit was smiling down on them from above, as the barrier that had separated the family had now been broken. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Lele kept her gaze fixed on the road as she and her teacher made their way to the fields where the rest of the villagers awaited. The girl sat beside the old man, who was currently controlling and navigating the horse as it pulled the rest of the wagon along the peaceful path that they were currently taking. It was windy that day, but any sense of dread or tension had long since vanished 
and the sun's rays penetrating through the thick trees created a beautiful image. They were, in fact, the last ones who had yet to leave. Isn't this a wonderful scene? Cato broke the silence, mesmerized by the environment around him. I'm relieved that the peace and tranquility of this land have been restored, he remarked, expressing his own joy. Without a doubt, it will be safe for the next village or community to settle in this land. The old man laughed. However, it wasn't exactly a pleasant experience to spend your time with the lost spirits of this place. He went on to share his daily experience coexisting with the trapped and restless ghosts. Even though they were located far away from the main village, these lingering souls were still able to stumble upon the cabin. It's a wonderful conclusion that all of these souls finally found their own peace in the next world. He sighed in relief. I wonder how will Mimosa react to this? Yet another thought came again. The woman was really a believer in myths and legends, a certain fascination with the spirits and other otherworldly elementals. He was quickly reminded of an important matter at that moment. His gaze was drawn to a letter beside him. The elderly man sighed. He had not yet opened the letter. The old man wasn't really prepared, no matter how many possibilities and topics this letter contained that he thought he could handle well. It had been a long time since he had responded or even spoken to her. He didn't want things to become awkward, even with letter communication. Heck, he didn't have time to think about the realities of his life because he was preoccupied with his own duties. He gave a sad and pitiful expression to himself. Returning his attention to his student, he was struck by the silence that surrounded her. The girl drifted off into the empty space, her mind preoccupied with her own thoughts. When he finally realized what was going on, he was disappointed in himself and the things he had done prior. Please accept my apologies, Lele. He finally said something. I was not carrying out my duties as your teacher. He continued saying, I grew into an ignorant old man. He said it with regret in his eyes, wanting to repent from those actions and become a better person than he had been. I promise, I'll be the best of my own character from now on. He was filled with a sense of peace. Cato finally mustered the courage to apologize to his student, which he had difficulty doing. All of the guilt and shame had faded, and it had been replaced by hope and promise. He was now given the second chance to do it all over again and this time he will never take it for granted ever again. Although he didn't receive a response from the girl, he knew deep down that she accepted his apology. Lele, for her part, smiled as the girl had finally forgiven the old man. With that, both the teacher and the student move on to the next chapter of their journey. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Carl's eyes widened as he realized what was going on. All this time, he had been convincing himself that it was all a figment of his imagination, born of his inner fear of the unknown. He'd been in shock the entire time, and now that his senses were returning, he had a lot of questions in his head that he desperately wanted to ask. Brian, on the other hand, acted surprisingly casually, as if he had quickly accepted the norm in this place. As he was about to move his lips for another conversation, the radio finally came to life as a voice burst from the speakers. This is Alness HQ. Can you please identify yourself? It was then when Brian's ears stood up and the man felt this sense of joy that he had not felt before since the first stages of the evacuation. Fuck yeah! The American Ranger suddenly burst out of joy, startling his friend in the process, who has not seen this kind of character in him. Though for most of the part, he too was overjoyed by the current news, yet failed to realize one thing. If this was the good news then the bad news was more of an embarrassment, since when the man had yelled out small expletives that he unknowingly had pressed the small button at the same time, resulting, the man on the other phone hearing his colorful words. At least, that's what he had thought. Both men were taken aback, releasing their own shocked expressions as panic started to set in. Brian knew he had screwed up big time. Sorry about that. The signal is acting up again. But could you please speak louder to whoever I'm speaking to? The voice inquired again. Brian breathed a sigh of relief as he heard this statement, knowing that he had a second chance to make things right. He took a deep breath to regain his composure and spoke through his radio, promising a smooth and quick conversation. This is Lieutenant Brian from RCT3 speaking. Heard you loud and clear, sir. May I ask, what's the status of your current reconnaissance? Oh boy, we got a whole village on our back here, and we might need assistance or at least back up to escort and protect the villagers along the way. The man explained and requested. There were brief moments of silence after that, as they began to hear multiple voices from the background of the person they were currently contacting. Their minds became slightly confused. After a few seconds, the voice spoke again. Ah uh, yes, Lieutenant Brian, your request for backup has been granted, but you'll need to proceed to the designated meeting point. The voice explained before adding, The exact location is the Greenfields. Usual meeting point? Carl wondered and muttered aloud. And Greenfields? Isn't that the place where? The young man trailed off, before realizing the big revelation. Brian, for one, had anticipated that this type of scenario would occur at some point. They had to leave right away for the meeting point in order to beat the time and to avoid more possible distractions. He simply nodded in return as he looked over to his fellow ranger. Yes, and looks like we are not the only ones with a big village to look after. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
quietly eating his MRE and fixated on his own thoughts. Come on guys, there's really no reason to argue about it. We all had different experiences that almost killed us. This time, Shino spoke up. I mean, if you asked me, I'm just glad I survived all those shits and surprise back there. She explained as she drank from her water bottle, still couldn't believe that she had outlasted one of the demons. Plus, Karada survived a grenade explosion and being stabbed by that hairy bastard. The young woman continued her own rants before casting a glance at the otaku soldier and smiling softly at him. Yeah, that was a badass move on his part, and it wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for some ghosts who were kind enough to show us the way out when we got lost. Higashi followed, recalling the most terrifying scenes he'd ever witnessed yet in this world. Of course, we might not make it back alive if Tuka and Lele aren't there to guide us, Mari added her own remark. I mean, those demons were nefarious. She then exhaled a sigh of relief. I guess so. Wataru shrugged, before gazing back at his own meal. That only leaves Furuta and Tomita, who have yet to tell their own stories. Both men were still recuperating from the events they had just experienced. To them, it was pretty terrifying that they were in the run for their lives while it was horrifying to see themselves tapping into the animalistic tendencies that they were not aware of, just to kill the creature with all their rage and wrath. They weren't themselves at the time, and it was best not to bring it up. So, Furuta and Tomita, I heard you guys were able to ride the LAV and kill the werewolf with a browning? Shino then asked this time around. Both men gave their own surprise and awkward expressions. Um, yes, Tomita took the browning, and I took the wheels and drove away. Furuta explained, trying to appear as unconcerned as possible. Tomita took a deep breath. Well, the demon was attempting to give chase, and it was much faster than we had anticipated, so I had no choice but to open fire on the enemy. He told his side of the story ignoring the expletives and unusual reactions he had at the time. Surprisingly, the majority of Recon's members raised their own eyebrows. Who would have guessed that there would be a vehicle chase seen among all the close encounters? Though, for the most part, the two were grateful for the help of a supernatural being. If it hadn't been for that small floating blue of light, we wouldn't have made it to the LAV. Furuta smiled, causing even more consternation among the others who were still wondering where the small entity had gone after they had overcome their own challenge. Is anyone going to talk about the strange voices in our heads? Kuwahara, who had been deafeningly quiet the entire time, said and added, I figured you'd all heard it at some point. When the rest of the team had heard the older man's statement, they all nodded and agreed with him. Aside from the things in their surroundings that had helped them overcome their own challenges, the mystery voice was the highlight of it all. It wasn't the work of the ghosts or the small entity that Furuda and Tomita had encountered before, but something else entirely. Yeah, that voice too. I've been hearing it since the evacuations have started. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and he hoped that it would make sense of everything. Same, but based on my observations I believe this tree is a beacon or an altar used to communicate with the gods. He presented his own theory, which piqued the interest of his friend. It's a tree of life. Once the man had finished his sentence, that an unfamiliar voice decided to enter their conversation. Both men, who had been startled by the mystery voice, turned to look at the source, and they all raised their eyebrows in surprise and amazement once more. From their right, a small floating blue orb manifest, followed by immediately morphing into its true form. A small cute cat-like anthropomorphic being with a large spherical head, small ears, narrow blue eyes, and a white snout, its limbs are quite stubby, lacking distinct digits, and its tails are quite stubby as well. The small entity was dressed in a gold and blue cape that concealed its sigil on its back, as well as a small pink purse with an emblem around its neck. Moreover, it looked like a cute stuffed animal with white and gray fur all over it. Oh, Kami! What the heck is that? Itami exclaimed as the man almost freaked out but eventually gathered his senses and calmed down in mere seconds. I have a name you know. The small entity spoke in this very cute high-pitched voice, letting out its own slightly annoyed expression. At least it gave them the idea that this newcomer was sentient. Yuji nodded and smiled. My name is Yuji, and this is my friend, Itami. He quickly waved his hand in greeting. We're sorry for our reactions right now. He then apologized. We're still not used to the surprises that this world has. He explained as he raised his hand once more. But other than that, it's nice to meet you. Terra is my name, Mr. Yuji. The small entity replied, as he politely took the man's offer and shook hands with him. Oh, Terra, it's a pleasure to meet you. The man finished his sentence before turning to look at the oracle, who was praying. I'm guessing you're acquainted with Ms. Rory over there? He then asked a question. Itami found it amusing to watch the latter interact with the supernatural entity. This world, it seems, just keeps surprising them with surprises they couldn't have predicted. Giant tree attacking beings, demigoddesses, and now supernatural cute anthropomorphic cat-like beings. The creature simply nodded. Yes, I've been in service and a companion to Ms. Rory since she became an apostle. He went on to explain. I see, so what are you supposed to be exactly? The now curious Itami asked this time. The small entity proudly smiled as he folded his arms. Simple, I am what you call a Chirithi, he explained. A Chirithi? Both men raised their eyebrows in confusion. Recognizing that the two had not yet learned of his existence, he sighed and chose to explain his side of the story in the simplest way possible in order to prevent exhaustion from returning. He could still feel the exhaustion that had set in after guiding and assisting the other men in green. Terra just nodded. Yes, indeed. A Chirithi is essentially an apostle's companion. He elaborated. We were created with the intent of serving our own masters for a lifetime until the day they are ascended to the heavens. With pride in his voice, he explained as he began to float around the two men, eventually landing on Yuji's shoulder. That's pretty cool, Itami said, not hesitating to let out his own amazement. Then I suppose you are the one responsible for helping some of the guys prior? Yuji raised an eyebrow as he gave his own guess. The mysterious small blue light that guided the recon members. The Chirithi simply nodded, scratching the back of its head. Exactly, your friends are really brave people who, by the way, risked their lives to put an end to the curse of this land. He spoke up, praising the group's efforts. Oh, I see. Yuji nodded in understanding. About this curse that the villagers were talking about, what really is the true story behind it? Itami asked since he had been hearing the same tale from the villagers themselves. There was a brief moment of silence before the Chirithi sighed again and raised his hand to cast certain magic. Moments later, their surroundings began to change as the two men witnessed what appeared to be memories from the past. While the memories began to play in front of their eyes, the small entity also spoke as it explained the background of the events leading to this. Hundreds of years ago, there was a big town that used to exist in this very land. He explained as an image of a lively and bustling community of a big village flashed before their eyes. Like any other normal place, this community lived peacefully until the war had reached their land. He explained. The image began to change, showing a large battalion of soldiers invading and occupying the town, with their general being installed and acting as the new mayor of the place. 
These soldiers brought corruption and dishonor to the town and did horrifying atrocities, he added, expressing his own sorrow. As the memories played out, it showed the villagers being accused, tortured, and executed for crimes they did not commit and out of joy. Worse, women and daughters were forced to be a plaything for the invading battalion's higher officials. Every day, these poor people suffered at hands of these men, and the only way to escape is either risking their lives to move out from the town or personally taking their own lives, the Chirthi said pausing for a few moments to watch the memories unfold, until all changed because of the actions of a few individuals. Three village men were shown by the memories. These men were good people, also fathers of their own families, and well known to the community for their contributions. When these men learned of the news that their wives and children had been forced into being a plaything, they took matters into their own hands, and created their own justice by assassinating the mayor responsible for the atrocities. The memory then showed these same men ambushing the mayor in a silent and quiet corridor brutally hacking the man to death with their own hatchets. They finally achieved their justice, rescued their families, and immediately sent them away from the town to escape the vengeance that was to come. The scene had now drastically changed, with the three men being captured, mocked, and their image and reputation tainted as they were led to the stakes for their own execution. However, this was no ordinary execution. There was dark energy that filled the area and among the angry and misled crowd. The corrupt high priest in charge of the last rites had made a grave intentional mistake. For your punishment, your hearts will be corrupted, and you men will serve darkness forever. From the words of the high priest, which had fueled the vengeance and rage of the men that the cursed had been born, soon demonic energy filled the entire place, and the fire began to rise towards the air, and the men vowed to use the dark powers vested upon them, had morphed into the demons they were and massacred everyone leaving no single soul left behind. Yuji and Itami were both horrified from what they had witnessed, while the Chirithi could only express his sadness. As a result, these demons stayed and roamed the land, slaughtering innocent people and even new communities that settled on this land, and they did worse than their tormentors, he added. The curse trapping their spirits to forever haunt the place. It wasn't until a band of mages decided to put an end to the curse by confronting these demons, but instead they only managed to trap them inside a scroll, never putting the tormented spirits to rest. But what happened to the scroll itself after all these years? Yuji inquired. I have no knowledge of what happened during those years, but according to the last surviving mage, the scroll was brought to a certain kingdom for safekeeping until it was passed down from generation to generation until it fell into the hands of Marcus Itami spoke this time as he mentioned the name of the late village official. Correct, Ms. Rory has been searching for that scroll in years. One of her goals is to purify these corrupted souls vent on destruction, Tara explained. That is why she settled into this village, hoping someday that someone will bring the scroll back to the land where it came to existence. It was a revelation, no wonder why Marcus was so disturbed and vigilant regarding the young lady's presence. He was indeed afraid of her. And, as a result of your arrival and assistance, the scroll has now been destroyed, and the nightmare that has plagued this land has finally been vanquished. Terra bowed as a sign of gratitude, now facing the two men as their surroundings changed. They were finally back in the forest a few moments later. Damn, this is really a lot to take in. Atami held his forehead as he didn't know what to do with the information, rather than rejoice with the rest. Speaking of curses, what is this floating blue essence that we keep seeing everywhere? Especially those floating around the tree? Yuji spoke up this time pointing at the certain tree in front of them, as the man was eager to learn more about the mysterious essence. As Tara was about to speak, a familiar voice beat him to it. The essence you are witnessing is the life force of this world. Rory finally arrived at the scene, having just finished the last of her prayers. Itami's eyes widened at the sight of the young lady's clothing. The dress itself was stunning, with unique designs that did not detract from its simplicity. There was a holy presence emanating from the dress. Life force? Yuji said. Simply nodding as a response, the young lady continued her words. Yes, they are the ones who keep this world together. She explained referring to the environment around them. Without them, all the trees, plants, 
and nature you see every day would perish. The young lady gazed upon the tree itself. What you see there is called a tree of life, she explained. It is a beacon provided by the gods themselves to prolong the life of a certain place. She then continued, Once a dark presence or curse invades the land, the tree itself will be corrupted and die. As she was about to continue her explanation, she was suddenly interrupted by her little companion. Come on old hag, I thought we were supposed to discuss the... Before he was cut from his words, Tara openly expressed his frustration though not realizing that he had also made a mistake. But his master eventually grabbed his ear in a comical manner. Ouch, what was that for? A semi-irritated Rory forced a grin while assuring the two Japanese men, who were quickly freaked out, that everything was fine. Her focus soon returned to her cheerthy. Oh Tara, how many times do I have to tell you not to call me by that moniker? She told him calmly and with a smile. All right, all right. I'm really sorry about it. Tara apologized immediately, to which the apostle accepted. Blime, you haven't changed a bit all these years, Rory. He made a remark while rubbing his large ear in a cute manner. Yuji and Itami were taken aback by the wholesome yet terrifying scene. Both men could sense the young lady's motherly wrath, and it reminded them of their own mothers. I apologize for Tara here, he's a little bit exhausted since. Come on Rory, you could have told me that there were multiple people that needed assistance. The Chirithi argued, while the young lady secretly just giggled, and patted the little entity on the head, before changing the subject the overall. There was one last thing for her to do, anyway. The oracle smiled as she returned her gaze to the majestic tree and then to the two young men. She slightly bowed down as to express a certain emotion and message. As the apostle and representative of my god, Emra, I hereby express his and my gratitude to you men in green, she said, expressing her own thanks and also informing both of them, for your assistance and contributions to finally free this land from its curse. The wind grew stronger as the peace continued to reign once again. There was nothing much to do here other than to get ready for the next journey. Yuji and Itami were at a loss for words at the time. Although they knew in the back of their minds that they had done something good in this world and to its people. In return, the two men bowed down as a sign of their own respect. The entire Recon team could not have completed the mission without their guidance and assistance as well. What started out as a normal reconnaissance mission had ended into something more different and special. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Her curiosity had piqued regarding the intriguing symbol that some of these men in green possessed. A symbol resembling or allegedly belonging to the emissaries of the sun god. As for the men in green themselves, they were all just eager to get back to their own base and find the rest they so richly deserved after such a long and arduous reconnaissance mission. It was a breathtaking sight to behold. Yuji found himself in the back of a certain LAV, alongside the exhausted Tomita, Furuta, Shino, Kuwahara, and Karada. All of them looked as if they went on hundred-day camping and hiking expedition to the mountains. Most of them were on the verge of going to a deep slumber, with Shino surprisingly taking the time to rest and lean on Karada's shoulder. The young man smiled before returning his attention to his notebook. A pen poised to fill the remaining blank white spaces while waiting for the writer to translate what was on his mind. He sighed to himself gazing towards the open view letting him the chance to see a wonderful sky, ultimately catching a glimpse of glory from the sun itself. A sense of peace and relief filled the man's mind as he deal with the final thoughts of the day. Yuji took a deep breath as he now knew what to write down in order to finally conclude the last chapter of a certain story arc. But before he could begin writing these words, the young man turned his gaze to the stunning view of the broad countryside. As he looked forward to a greater future in this very world, a smile grew across his lips. Whatever the obstacles and circumstances may be, it would be another wild journey yet again. It was safe to say that this chapter of their journey had come to a wonderful conclusion. As the wagons, carriages, and LAVs left the land, a small white dove can be seen flying above the rest, heading towards the vast fields and the countless ruins of villages, symbolizing the return of hope in this world. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
a band of imperial soldiers' simple journey felt like they were on a path to conquer a hundred kingdoms. A sense of exhaustion and discomfort weighed heavily on their shoulders, and despite being informed and properly prepared for this mission, they still questioned whether this was the right thing to do. Silence had been reigning for days since they left the capital gates. A long single file of horses traveled across the vast green fields surrounded by valleys, hills, and towering mountains. Despite the fact that the weather was calm that day, the strong wind persisted and a certain tension in the air remained. Darius was still lost in his own thoughts. There was no reason to question why he was given a much larger group of soldiers for this small expedition. That's why, before leaving, he gave these men time to talk and say goodbye to their families, knowing that the inevitable could just be around the corner. Aside from the well-known lands, the region of Alnus is no exception, with a good number of sacred and cursed lands, giving the group plenty of reason to be wary and cautious. He already knew that they were the ones next in line for this simple expedition, and with the task of locating an important individual, who had sought refuge into one of these cursed lands, what could possibly go wrong? The man had heard the tales ever since he was a young boy. The urban legend of a certain land was infamous for shedding the innocent blood of those who dared to settle there. In an unexpected twist, the legend itself was well documented, with accounts from travelers, merchants, and even soldiers who passed through or ventured into the area itself. These same people considered themselves fortunate to have survived even for a few minutes. They all claimed the same details, ranging from vengeful spirits attempting to take them away from the living world to demonic creatures emerging from the depths of the underworld to claim their blood. For their case, the perspective on the subject at hand was very different. Apparently, the previous groups prior and that were tasked for the same expedition, had never returned. Not even a single survivor made a presence. This kind of scenario prompted the young captain to request a guide. A guide who is more knowledgeable about the region itself, and the type of person who could assist them in locating the cursed land's exact location. The young captain wondered why most expeditions, be it small or a grand one, often did not request guides or even assigned one. Was it because of pride? Was it recklessness or just pure blind confidence? Sir Darius, may I ask, who's this person that is going to act as our guide? A voice of a boy called him out. The young imperial captain looked at a brown-haired adolescent boy riding his own horse. To keep the identity in check, he donned a simple traveler's outfit with a design semi-influenced by the empire. Aiden is his name, raised in a simple family from one of the empire's conquered territories. When he found out he was going to be assigned and be part of an imperial expedition as an observer, he was overjoyed in both his heart and his eyes. How could a new recruit like him be a part of such a simple yet important mission? He wasn't going to accept the simple explanation of him being an exception since he was a trainee under his wing. He knew there were more reasons behind this. He felt a shiver run down his spine when he realized he was part of a group heading towards the cursed land of legend. For the first time, the boy felt this sense of dread. Never he had ever faced something that would be more akin to the supernatural. The demons and mythical creatures that he had heard from the countless tales told by his family and friends. The fact that he had disclosed this kind of venture from them, so they won't be filled with worry. Even I do not know. With an unsure tone of voice, his superior responded to his question. Who was this guide exactly? Wasn't he supposed to be with the rest of them during the early stages of the journey? or even before they left the gates of the walled city? But of all places, where can we meet him? The boy then asked another question. Darius only managed a sliver of a smile. He was indeed informed about him prior to the journey. A type of person even the prince himself recommends. Someone that is worth trusting and has no records of double-crossing people. No need to worry, we are almost there. The wind grew stronger. As the small expeditionary force climbed and passed the supposed last ridge, they came across the same road path on a much larger field, but with a large crossroads located in the middle. As the horses moved forward, Aiden's eyes were drawn to a figure standing in the middle of the crossroads. The tension in the air gradually increased, and before long, they were approaching the first leg of their journey. As they got closer to the crossroads, the figure's identity began to emerge. The men were greeted by this new mystery. The supposed guide they were to meet was this veiled figure shrouded in silence. 
His face was hidden beneath his hood, with the exception of some sections of his facade, which revealed a modest traveler's outfit and a pair of light brown leather boots to cover his feet. The horses stopped their tracks as the Imperial Expedition had finally met their so-called guide. The silence continued to take charge in their surroundings. There was a brief moment when the soldiers seemed intimidated and felt fear creeping up to them, and if not for the veiled figure raising his hand as a sign of his own greeting. So you are the ones that I'm supposed to attend to? The cloaked figure finally spoke, with youthfulness radiating in his voice. He kept his interest at a high level. Darius simply nodded as a response. Yes, sire, he said before adding. So you are the guide that he assigned for this expedition? He then asked. Do you know where exactly is this forgotten settlement? The guide smiled behind his hood. Of course, Captain, the forest is not that far away from here, he explained, turning towards a certain direction. Just only a few miles to travel. He pointed towards the last view where a big portion of the forest could be seen, signaling the end of the journey, that we may finally reach our destination. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he finally discovered what really happened to him. Darius picked up the small weapon and continued to examine it. The barrel itself still had its bullets left, hinting that the man had participated in a battle of some sort or worse. By the looks of it, your friend met something terrible. A voice then broke the silence as a new presence arrived in the area. The Imperial Captain's attention went towards a familiar figure in the form of a cloaked person, who had entered the premises. If you were to ask me, he partook this action as to bring the curse that plagued this land to an end. The calm voice of the guide spoke, sharing his own thoughts regarding the matter. Darius narrowed his eyes. What makes you say that? He asked, wondering what this man had to do with the said event. Marcus wanted to avoid and seek refuge from the forces he had provoked, and whatever he had discovered there is something worth investigating. The guide explained, while slightly looking away. I'm afraid to say that the man met a tragic fate while pursuing his goals. The hooded guide gave a slight chuckle in return. It's just my own guess, sir, and from what I learned carrying a great burden will take one's sanity away. The guide replied, For whatever happened in this land before, I could no longer sense the dark presence, or even any remnants of it. Darius remained silent this time. It was indeed true on what happened to the men who had previously held and guarded the relic. They all suffered the same fate, its power dragging them away from what they were used to be, to the point that they were ready to take their own lives or even commit the horrible acts. However, in the man's case, it appeared that he took matters into his own hands in order to finally break the cycle that continued starting from his forefathers until the burden reached unto to him. It seems that he had eventually succeeded in his task. The guide then added while looking up towards the open hole in the roof which showed the tranquil sky and sun, but with the cost of his life. Just as the latter finished his sentence, the small manicom crystal around the young imperial captain's neck began to glow, and a voice then spoke through it. Sir Darius, we request your presence immediately as possible. Apparently, one of the imperial soldiers said with a hint of worry and urgency in his voice. The imperial captain shifted his gaze to the crystal manicom and immediately held it. I heard you clear as day sir, may I know what the current situation is? He inquired, his curiosity rising as every second passed. A few moments of silence passed as the imperial soldier replied with just a simple phrase. We finally located it. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
and that symbol itself was considered belonging to one particular magic spell. Who or what was he trying to protect himself from? He wondered as he tried to analyze the situation at hand. Moving forward, the boy finally reached the main room, finding himself being greeted by stacks of books and documents scattered everywhere around the room. A beautiful mess that he had not seen before. Looks like Sir Marcus was really that knowledgeable. The boy let out another comment, slowly believing what the rumors say regarding the man being a scholar during his time. He felt pity to see that a man, who was formerly looked up to by many, had fallen from his grace. Aiden's attention then shifted towards a lone table beside the window. Particularly, his interest was piqued when he saw the crystal and a single small brown envelope beside it. There was the familiar image of the Empire's old flag projecting from the crystal itself, revealing that the man's allegiance to his homeland had remained strong all along. However, it made the boy wonder why the latter had used the old flag rather than the current one. Sadera, he believed, wanted to forget its past. Yet there was something amiss here. By then his gaze was drawn towards the small brown envelope on the table, noticing a small red seal engraved on it. He knew he can't open it due to the fact that the seal requires a more important individual to do it. In just seconds, the silence was broken. Strange, why would he fill his house with illusion spells and magical defensive barriers, if there were no threats, to begin with? Just then the voice of Captain Darius broke the silence as the man himself along with the second-in-command soldier entered the room. It's not far-fetched for the Empire to easily track down individuals accused of treason or sedition. The second-in-command soldier explained, sharing his own theory and thoughts. The only difference is that they'll employ ones that don't belong to their own kind. Darius simply nodded in understanding, as the young man observed the former noble's room. A sense of sadness overwhelmed him, wondering how a promising individual like him would end up in such a state. He was so persistent in wanting to dig deeper to find out a kind of truth that wouldn't surely exist. Was the man truly that insane? Or was he claiming to have discovered something that would change the course of this land's history? Captain Darius. And at that moment, the teenage boy called out to him, approaching with a certain brown envelope in his hand. I believe Sir Marcus had written this letter for you, Aiden informed his superior, handing the supposed letter, contained inside the brown envelope, to the man. Darius wasted no time as he took the envelope from the boy's hand. His eyes went to the small red noble seal itself observing and wondering what his message would be this time around. Slowly, a part of him encouraged the man to shift his gaze to a specific wall, where an illustration greeted him. Unlike the other incantations and symbols from the other rooms and areas, the illustration in front of him was presented as some sort of message. He recognized the Empire's small symbol, though it was hidden within a much larger drawing. His eyes soon widened in surprise, placing the pieces back together inside his mind just in time to see the whole picture. The man, speechless and shocked, stared at an image of a demonic creature on the wall, with the flag of the empire, on top of its own large hands. Others were stunned, and some were horrified. The artwork alone might send chills down their spines or give them nightmares for days. However, an idea immediately returned, especially in the thoughts of the young commander. Not only did he feel a sense of fear, but so did the rest of the Imperial soldiers inside the room, coming to the realization that they came across another subtle warning about the place they called home. For so many years, Darius, still dazed by his own thoughts, turned his gaze to the small envelope. The man hoped that the real truth would be included in whatever message he read this time. However, the only words he could think of right now were, What in the world is going on? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Instead, they could see swaths of a blue-green ethereal essence floating and encircling the various parts of the village. It was a relief to them to learn that the curse location had been cleansed and returned to nature. Some of the soldiers would go on to claim that brave individuals had finally confronted the evil forces and put them to rest once and for all. As hours passed, the time had finally come for the darkness to emerge again. The day had finally come to an end as the moon slowly revealed its presence in the fading sky, and the night had arrived in the blink of an eye. Because of these occurrences, the group had finally concluded their mission for the day and set up camp in a nearby open field. Silence had still reigned upon them but the mood in the air had calmed down letting the rest of the soldiers spend the night without fully worrying about what could befall them next. Darius sat down on the grass and quietly gazed at the bonfire in front of him. While most of everyone was enjoying the rest they deserved, the young man spent time with his own thoughts. In an attempt to figure out and make sense of what had transpired, how is that even possible? He asked himself, holding a piece of parchment which was revealed to be the letter itself, finally released from the envelope. There has to be more than just losing one's sanity. He muttered to himself, his skepticism slowly being shattered. By then, a familiar teenage boy arrived at the scene. Captain, Aiden called his superior's attention, handing him what appeared to be a piece of elven bread wrapped in melon leaves. Darius smiled in return as he accepted the boy's offer. Thank you, Aiden, he said afterward. The delicious taste of these thin cakes never gets old. According to a popular belief that one bite of it will fully satisfy one's stomach for a day. He never recalled being able to feel that certain hungriness in him when he took a bite of the bread. As time continued on, the boy also sat beside the young captain, noticing his bothered expression. Is everything all right, sir? The boy then asked. You looked very concerned. The older man simply nodded in return. I am all right, Aiden, he said, taking a bite of the bread. I just need a little time to gather my thoughts and senses. Silence befell for a few moments before a thought came to the boy. Is it true that the Empire is really bent on invading Kwatoin and uniting this continent? He asked, often hearing the same old reason and motivation told by the many officials he had met before. He was skeptical of it. Darius could only sigh as he then let out a small chuckle afterward. Truthfully, I still have no clue regarding it. He soon explained. I've always been told since I was just a young child that the Empire's motivation originated from a vow and an ambition to rise from the ashes of the last war. He added, recalling how the nobles and even the common people were very supportive of that certain dream. Till to this day that sad era is still clinging to it, even though how it has already become twisted. The boy just stared at him, his curiosity still at a high level. Although, I still wonder if that was really the case. Darius continued on, Remembering a certain person from his past. My grandfather always reminded me to cautiously believe what other people relay. He explained as he could feel his hands slightly shaking. Through him, he was able to learn some of Satyr's secrets, which were kept away from the public, and even to some of the nation's important figures themselves. Unfortunately, no one believed the information, considering it as bogus rather than a full-pledged theory. What story is that, sir? The boy inquired once more. The wind grew stronger at that moment. The young imperial captain briefly glanced at his surroundings in a slight urgency. He managed to calm himself down before continuing on. I leave this information up to you, he said before adding, but it is your choice whether you believe this or not. He took another deep breath, gathering himself as the boy continued to listen. It is said that Sadera was once a peaceful kingdom, one of the nations that had the gods' blessings he explained. And when a great war and calamity struck the entire continent, everything changed from that point on, he said, pausing briefly before continuing. Everything that had transpired until this very day originated from those past actions of those former kingdoms, which eventually destroyed the once pure hearts of our home. Yes, there was a time that Sad Arrow was willing to help them to conquer. Aiden felt a tinge of sadness wash over him. Outside of this circle in the capital, People expressed their fear and hatred for the place where he was raised. His friends and relatives from other provinces had already warned him and his family to leave the land, and if possible, the continent itself. Silence took charge briefly. Darius, in his part, had shifted his thoughts to a certain white-haired beauty. 
A bittersweet smile crept across his lips. Whatever way he attempted to persuade her to leave the place as soon as possible for greener pastures, yet she still wouldn't do so, no matter what. That certain aspect of her continued to amaze him as time passes. She really did care for her own people, and she will never give up until she could finally break the chains that had bound her home to the empire. It was one of the main concerns that continued to bother him until now. If the young woman pursued that very goal, then it could possibly lead to a much more difficult scenario. Though, it was no longer familiar to him as he had seen many good people who fell from grace. If it would come to strike the young warrior bunny, he would do everything in his power to prevent that, even if it meant risking his very life. Indeed, there was corruption that had poisoned the minds of the ones in charge. Even the emperor himself was oblivious to that blinded by his own goals and trust towards a much more horrible individual. Only a handful are aware of the real truth and he himself was now starting to believe it. Only time will tell. Unbeknownst to him and the boy, the expedition's cloaked guide had taken an interest in their conversation and had been listening in for several minutes. As he sat across the bonfire, he let out a faint smile in response to the topic, then observed the rest of the imperial soldiers around him. Sadly, these men haven't realized who they are currently serving. As the night continued on, the coldness strengthened, and the strong wind began to let its presence known more around the area. The letter to which was concealed in darkness, and still on the man's hand, began to move along with wind, presenting itself near the fire as a part of its own light was able to project towards the parchment revealing a phrase written at the very end of it. A certain phrase that led the imperial captain to keep repeating it inside his mind, and to finally doubt and wonder for the first time. This isn't longer our home. Chapter End And hello there fellas. So this chapter is a continuation of the secret promise chapter, just a recap of that certain chapter, which included a cameo of Tyle at the very end. To shed some light regarding her in the story, she is the same Tyle that we know and loved. It's just that the situation is a bit different hence why she acted that way. The Darius character on the other hand is, well, it's kinda a bit tough to explain it. Though I plan on portraying the man as one of the last representations of hope or light that is keeping the warrior bunny queen's pureness and mind in check. For example, if you know of Mikey from Tokyo Revengers, he had these certain important people that represented his light that kept him away from fully being engulfed by the darkness in him. Though, unfortunately, it ended tragically for him. But still, the idea may change along the way. Lastly, there are numerous hints regarding what the Empire would be like in this story. To be honest, I am still polishing the idea. But the main outline for it is that Sadera used to be this simple kingdom, which was taken advantage of and left for dead in the past, and that created one of the main motivations to conquer and take upon the other kingdoms that wronged it. But the question is that, how did the kingdom manage to rise from the ashes in just a short span of time? How and where did get the help it needed to bounce back? Those are just some of the questions that led me to expand and explore the idea more. Again, I really don't plan on implementing a war story genre on this. If I'm going to, then I wanted it to be more unique and different, far away from the military showcase and stuff. And in addition, I consider this chapter as somewhat a prelude to the next story arc. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and God bless. 18. Arc 1 Finale A Calm After the Storm Disclaimer I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1 Finale Special Chapter Calm After the Storm In every aftermath of a story, there's always the time for everyone to recuperate and regather their own selves before proceeding to the next one. New World Journal It was the sunset itself that became the main reason for everyone to halt their own tracks. Horse-driven wagons, carriages, and carts formed into a very long line during the duration of the journey, which became a small hurdle for the reconnaissance team as members would have to travel all the way back to just inform the villagers. Fortunately, the two leaders of RCT-3 had foreseen it, and ordered two of the LAVs to be stationed in critical areas of the line. One is in the middle of the line, and the other is at the end. Once the signal was given, 
the other groups in the two LAVs would proceed to make a series of honks that would eventually alert the rest of the villagers, which it did. The metal forts. They are blowing the horns once again. What could this actually mean? The small commotion did cause some concern among the locals. Such sounds would indicate that a new ordeal is approaching, or it could simply be the normal announcement of taking a short break. The group had been traveling for hours, and since they had left the land, minor issues such as several wagons becoming stuck in mud became one of the most difficult obstacles to overcome. They were able to overcome those obstacles with the help of the men in green's moving metal forts and a little magic from the mages themselves. Rory had been a witness to these scenarios. Even she herself had to step out from the horseless carriages in order to help the villagers in need, mostly from a physical standpoint by unloading several chests, boxes, and baskets before they could take action. The usual procedure was for Lele or Kato to cast a spell to remove the wooden wheels from the muddy ground, and then the men in green's metal forts would do the next task by tapping into their own acceleration power, and with a thick rope tied to the wagons themselves so that they could all be pulled easily without breaking or destroying anything. The recon team saw this as an advantage for everyone, a good way to solve the problem. She couldn't recall how many times she had unloaded the green carriage to lend her assistance. But with this last announcement signaling another day's rest, a thought came into her mind. Pardon me, but mind if I ask a question? She said garnering the attention of the men in green, who was with her inside the metal carriage. How far are we reaching Alnus Hill? She politely asked. Almost there, Ms. Rory. But we needed to stop the journey for a while. It's almost getting dark. Itami was the one to explain this time around, in the midst of numerous voices coming from the radio. Indeed, the continuous horns and radio chatters were enough to act as an alarm clock to get the rest of the members out from their own slumber. With the exception of Yuji, who had stayed awake for the past several hours observing the moving scenery outside. Damn, I was already having a good dream and nap, Shino exclaimed, rubbing her eyes and fighting the minor irritations. Didn't expect you to be napping on Karada's shoulder, Tomita remarked jokingly, causing the young woman to widen her eyes as she moved away from the otaku soldier, albeit with a slight blush. Mari and Hitoshi could only chuckle in response, while Karada himself was unable to speak because he was still drowsy. Rory, on the other hand, had made an amused expression as she sensed small spikes of love surrounding the two. All right, people, we gotta help the rest set up the camp for the night. When the announcement was made by Atami himself, everyone began to unload the vehicle, and when the young man stepped back onto the ground, he was greeted by an unexpected sight. As the darkness descended, everyone's gaze shifted to the front, their eyes widening in surprise and amazement especially for the villagers themselves. What they saw was breathtaking, as if they had been transported to the glittering cities of the northeast. But for the recon members, what they saw reminded them of something they'd seen before. Are we back in Tokyo already? I don't remember seeing the base with plenty of buildings and camps outside. I mean do appreciate them installing street lights if they are really building a town. I'm pretty sure they finally built that second camp somewhere around. It didn't take too long for some of them to give their own comments. Surely, they left the fort having remembered it as a quiet base in the middle of vast fields and wastelands, even at night. There were only a few lights that were left open in important parts. Surely, Yuji couldn't recall how the base in Alnus Hill has this many lights. It felt as if he was staring at the first signs of a lively city from afar. Though he had to agree that the scene was really wonderful to look at and in the midst of the growing darkness. It could act as the group's beacon and reminder that they weren't that far away from their destination. A smile crept upon Rory's lips, feeling more surprised that the journey was really nearing an end. She took brief glance at the moving metal forts, wondering if they had something to do in reaching the fields that quick. Looking back at the wonderful view of the hill to which she began to admire for the first time, these people and their world never failed to amaze her. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X It was the cheers and laughter of numerous villagers and soldiers alike that had drastically alleviated the mood inside the camp. Lieutenant Brian, on the other hand, was already familiar with the appearance, having witnessed massive refugee camps in his own world. The only thing that differed greatly was the atmosphere itself, as for the first time, he was surrounded by a sense of warmth and safety. 
The man's gaze moved as he noticed several bonfires that provided light to the wagons and carriages, as well as the villagers who were finally resting on their makeshift camps. In the middle of the fields, a scene that felt more like a new village had been established. Numerous families in the midst of enjoying their own meals and spending time together, friends and relatives sharing their own stories without the interference of any anxious thoughts and warnings. For the first time, Brian returned the smile. It was truly heartwarming to see these people who were able to return to their lives and live them on this very night. It reminded him of how he and his family used to spend time together on camping nights. It was all just about bonding together and singing songs. The Californian found himself leaning on the hood of the LAV, which was parked near where Third Recon's camp was currently set up. For the time being, he was alone with his orange juice box, which he was currently drinking. In fact, he wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to be alone and reflect on what had happened during this reconnaissance mission. He was not the only one who wanted to make sense of what was left of his own skepticism. As soon as he was deep in his thoughts a familiar presence entered the scene and a familiar voice of a certain Japanese lieutenant spoke. Lieutenant Brian. Itami smiled as he approached his American counterpart. Lieutenant Itami. He greeted back and nodded in return, as Third Recon's captain joined in. How's everything going so far, chief? He asked quickly, only to be met with a chuckle. Itami sighed, his face flushed with exhaustion. He leaned on a vacant spot near the closed window, holding a small cup of hot chocolate milk, his eyes focused on the entire camp itself. Been doing a lot of sweeping and checkups on the entire camp itself, he explained, while wiping a small portion of sweat falling towards his cheeks. Just making sure that the rest of the villagers are safe and don't have the reason to worry anymore. Brian slightly nodded in understanding. I see. He muttered before the Japanese man handed him a small triangular-shaped snack, which was wrapped in some sort of banana leaf. Oh, what's this? He raised both eyebrows in curiosity, as he examined the unfamiliar snack. Itami formed a small smile. The villagers called it elven bread, he explained. Oh, you mean the elven bread from... The Japanese man shrugged. It could be or could be not. But if you're gonna ask me, I believe this to be the real thing. He grinned as he took a bite of the same snack on his hand. Even the food in this world was driving them nuts. Was this really that one snack that could make you full for the days ahead? It didn't take long enough for the man to take his own bite as well. The snack was seemed to be baked and had that little crispy feeling. It felt like somewhere in between a bread and a wafer, though it was definitely sweet and pleasant. Not bad. This is actually tasty, he commented proceeding to officially devour the snack on his hand. His growling stomach soon faded and the hunger in him disappeared. Soon a wave of amazement followed. I told you so. I'll definitely bring a bag when I get the chance to go back to the other side of gate. Itami continued to smile. Risa is going to love this. Definitely. Brian formed his own smile. Hope Melinda and the kids would like this. He thought to himself, instantly remembering his beloved family back home. Both men were essentially excited to take any opportunities just to visit and spend time with them once more. Brian wanting to make up for the time that he wasn't there while Itami trying to personally prove that he was alright and in one piece to his wife. Besides that aspect, they still had to fulfill their own responsibilities. So what is like being the leader of your own team, Brian San? Itami asked. The Californian lieutenant sighed but smiled. It's often a roller coaster ride. He shook his head slightly. You never know what kind of situation you're going to be placed in. He explained while slowly rubbing his other hand. And somehow in every mission, I always keep being placed along with the people I knew. He slightly laughed regarding those small details. As if a part of home wanted coming along with me. How lucky I was. I can relate to that. Itami chuckled and said, shifting his eyes towards the rest of his team. The man can't even remember how long he had been Third Recon's captain. As time passes by, he began to see them as his own second family. There was just something special about the bond that this group had for a long time. Maybe this was the reason why he wanted to fulfill his responsibility. Not just as a leader but as a big brother to the group. Do you think we still have a lot of things to go through after this? Lieutenant Brian asked this time as silence slowly began to take over once more. Itami expressed an uncertain face. 
He too had no idea what would happen next. Not that I'm aware of, but I have a feeling we won't be going home anytime soon, he explained, before adding. There will be multiple storms ahead from this point on. The man could feel it, even if he hoped it would be the last. A warning or a random prophecy? Let's just be ready for what is to come. He finished his statement. Lieutenant Brian sighed in return. Only way to find out. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The little bunny girl, in turn, bowed slightly to the two men before fleeing the scene. There was a pall of sadness around her. It's a minor detail that they've noticed whenever her name is mentioned. As if she was afraid of her name since it was similar to the once great queen that ruled her home. Is she alright Tomita? Hitoshi expressed his concern. His friend could only shrug. I hope, according to the chief, Kota Village did have a very small population of demi-humans in the community, but they soon left before our arrival, he explained. So maybe this girl was forced into adoption, or maybe she had been adopted for a long time, Hitoshi speculated. I mean, that kind of scenario is entirely possible. This was the first time he'd seen something that wasn't human. Furthermore, when her name was mentioned, the girl appeared hesitant and cringing. Tomita shrugged once again. Beats me. X sex 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 sex. So you're telling me you took on a giant werewolf that had been chasing you and managed to slice them in half with a combat knife? Daisuke's curiosity had peaked. The man sat amongst the circle of his fellow recon members as he continued to bombard them with some of his questions. He thought he was the only one that encountered something out of the ordinary. Recon members, particularly Shino, Mari, Higashi, and Karada, had their own stories to tell, which were more endearing, breathtaking, and yet too unbelievable to believe, or perhaps it was just him. I have to admit, I got lucky during that time. I was on top of that wolf's head and suddenly the knife was able to slide down like it was cutting butter. Shino continued, still bragging about her encounter with the beast. I mean, who else was I going to have to deal with besides that? The young lady inquired, continuing to drink her beverage at the same time. Fair enough. Daisuke shrugged and nodded. But what Karada did at the time was even more badass, if you were to ask me. This time, Higashi spoke up, proudly patting the otaku on the back. Karada rolled his eyes in return, which surprised the man. Did he use to make that particular expression a lot? Come on man, I almost got my head eaten by a demonic lichen, so I had no choice, the otaku replied, appearing evasive about the subject. Daisuke then raised both eyebrows. By the way, is it true that those beasts can talk? What did it tell you? He asked, changing the subject. Karada simply shrugged. Well it could really talk, and it told me what was my last words were before it was about to eat me. He explained, recalling that moment. So I told him go eat shit, and I just throw the grenade towards its mouth. His mind continued to remember, and by that point, he fully accepted his final fate. At least he was going out in a blaze of glory. And all he wanted from that then on, is to take one final look at his friends, especially towards a certain tough young lady. The rest were left speechless by the young man's remark. Another detail was that he had this slight seriousness surrounding him as if all those events had somewhat changed him. For Shino's part, this was the first time she felt curious about the otaku. Normally people amongst the division would just shrug it off except for the other JSDF soldiers, who were also otakus in their own right. For this once, she finally had the chance to see through what the young man is really like beneath that facade. She didn't feel the same annoyance anymore during that moment. I gotta tell you, Karada, what you did there was both badass and courageous. Mari spoke this time with the usual smile. You almost got us crying there, you know? She pointed it out, still a bit in disbelief regarding what happened during that time. A wide grin finally came out from Karada. Oh is that so? He slightly snickered. Then I guess I'm that good of an actor. The young man now had two faces of himself. The rest of the group did react and laugh at his remarks. But most of them breathed a sigh of relief, worried that the good old Karada had seemingly vanished forever. All this time, they had finally gotten used to the man's antics, and seeing him in a different character was very surreal for them. It was at that point when Daisuke cleared his throat, having heard all of their opinions. Well, you all convinced me, but seriously, the ghosts and spirits in this world are very different from ours. He pointed it out, before adding, to think we can see them right in front of our eyes without even activating our sixth senses. Sheesh, you got a point though, Higashi said as he raised a hand and then proceeded to take another bite of his snack. So does that mean our own six senses were activated when we saw those ghosts? Karada spoke once more, his words giving the chills towards his comrades. Damn it! 
I am not going to get involved in this ghost nonsense again, Shino shivered, his face flushed with panic and annoyance. She'd had her fill of ghosts. Her previous close encounter with them was most likely the most terrifying of all. As for the rest of her JSDF colleagues, they were forgetting the fact that the tough lady is afraid of ghosts. Mari smiled, don't worry Shino, we're all afraid of seeing ghosts. Bad ghosts, she explained, trying to cheer up the latter. Mari-san's got a point. Higashi nodded and agreed. What's to be afraid of if they were all good ghosts? I object. Daisuke followed. All ghosts, be it good and bad, are really dangerous. And we won't probably be encountering ghosts in the future, Karada said, as his eyes began to sparkle with optimism. Bring on the trolls, ogres, magical girls, demon lords, druids, and necromancers, he exclaimed. And Nikos. While the others laughed, Shino chose to groan and cringe in response to his remarks. It appeared that the old Karada had finally resurfaced. Nonetheless, she remained optimistic. You know, by this point, we should really study more of the creatures in this world to get a better idea of how we're going to survive, Higashi suggested to the group. I mean, this isn't just about war and rescue missions, he added. You may never know what still lies out there. By then silence had taken charge once more. The man's words had a cryptic quality to them. It could be a foreshadowing or simply a warning for them. In fact, Karada informed them before those various aspects of this world could be compared or have similarities to their own version of fictional fantasy genres. There was a slight tension in the air as the others were lost in their own thoughts, wondering what they were going to do next. Shino being the passive person she is sighed rolling her eyes and expressing another kind of her own sassiness. Well, why not? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Do you have any plans to go back to Rondell? Hodder asked. The old man then took a glance at the camp where the men in green currently resided. I do have plans yet, we still have our own journey to finish, he replied. They helped us a lot, to the point that I can't think about any ways to repay them back. I see. The elf man nodded in understanding. They too promised too to provide us a new home, he said, a glimmer of hope showing in his eyes. It would be unbelievable if they asked for our skills and expertise soon, he chuckled. Though, I do hope that they don't have any corruption in their hearts. You got a point there old man. Though, I wonder what thoughts Rory has regarding these people and their intentions. Cato wondered, still confused about what the apostles' plans would be from now on. In fact, she did manage to sense the goodness in these people. A reason for them to not worry about the trusting side of things. Whenever the girl says something about a particular place, event, or person, they might as well be prepared to believe her. And at that moment, Cato raised both eyebrows in curiosity. Speaking of Rory, where in the world has she gone off to now? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
They are surely going to love this, Rory added, referring to her old friends back home. Carl and Ael's hands were now both full of cards, as defeat had arrived on their doorsteps. The two were still stunned at how the situation had been turned around, and they were now desperately attempting to reclaim their lead, but to no avail. Damn it! Carl could only mutter to himself, while his fellow recon member kept silent all throughout. Before long, their choices began to diminish, leaving them with only one option left. All right, Ms. Rory, I guess you guys won the game. The Californian soldier sighed in defeat as he placed all of his cards on the table, signaling his surrender. You can stop now, Al. He then told his friend, who was still trying hard to reclaim their former advantage, but it was all useless. After a two-hour competitive and intense match, the Apostle and her Chirithi emerged victorious, giving themselves a high five, as they had learned from the American Rangers themselves. I told you, men, that we would win. Rory smiled and said, rubbing her hands together in delight. And we'll be taking these sweets as well, Tara remarked. Walking up to the pile of Twinkies as the Chirithi began to grab each of them and place them in a small basket. Carl and Al could only watch and cringe as their treasures were taken away from them. Of course, regrets were usually a part of the process. And Twinkies were considered the holy grail for them out of all the snacks they had eaten in their lives. They soon found themselves watching the two eat the Twinkies in front of them, which was a difficult experience. I must say, these Twinkies are such a delight, Rory cheerfully remarked once more, as the young lady paired the soft small cakes with her tea, creating a unique dynamic. Tell me gentlemen, how in the world these beautiful cakes are made, she added, showing genuine interest. A brief moment of quietness befell the area. Al was the first one to reply as the man scratched the back of his head. He still couldn't get over the loss. It's kind of complicated, Ms. Rory, he said. The young lady raised both her eyebrows. Oh, I see. And at that very moment, a thought came up to Carl's mind, realizing that this was the perfect time to ask a question that had been lingering in his head. Ms. Rory, may I ask, how's life been for you being a centuries-year-old person? The man finally asked, seemed a bit nervous since he wasn't sure if this was a sensitive topic for the apostle. And if I can add, how does one apostle become immortal? Fortunately enough, the young lady smiled. Well, I assume you're asking this out of curiosity, rather than wanting to achieve a life without death? She raised an eyebrow, politely wanting to clarify the man's exact desires. Her voice was also filled with sadness from that then on. Um, yes, Carl replied as if he didn't know what to say about it. He was as surprised as he had always been. Tara took a quick glance at his superior, puzzled on how the young lady was going to explain her entire story. Rory took a small breath and spoke. Becoming an apostle is such a complex process, you have to be dedicated to serving the God and religion that you are in, she explained. That includes staying away from any family affairs and interactions and the other of life's distractions. I had to learn the difficult way of becoming what I am now, Rory explained, expressing a little bit of sorrow in her eyes, recalling those painful moments. And once you finally claim the position, you'll spend a whole life traveling and purifying the remnants of any dark energy or curse in this world. Until you've reached the thousand-year mark, Tara spoke as he finished the last sentence of her master. Carl and Al stared wide-eyed at the young lady. Both men couldn't believe the process one has to go through in order to ascend to another plane. They could tell that it was a heck of a stressful job. What happens after the thousand-year mark then? Carl asked. Rory smiled. It's simple. You get a wish granted or you finally ascend as a bona fide god or goddess and be a part of the rulers of this world, she explained. At least, that's how my church had been preaching for many years. Man, that's really a lot to take in, Al remarked. Sure both of them would rather choose to live a normal life with their families rather than isolate and commit themselves to a thousand year enlightening. God only knows how would the experience affect their overall minds. Is it okay if I ask one more question, Ms. Rory? But why did you choose to become an apostle in the first place? Al inquired this time. I mean, is it because you want to live longer? Quietness befell the area once again. The young lady looked down fondly remembering certain people who were precious and important to her even until now. She responded with a sigh and a smile. 
Well, just let's say that I loved my family dearly and I wanted for all of them to receive blessings and live a peaceful and good life. She explained as she clasped her hands tightly in prayer. At that moment, a small tear fell from her eye. Even until now, she always thought that she chose the right decision ever since that fateful day. It was the only way to save them. Carl and Al stood there staring at the young lady, unsure what to say or do. Even though they had considered a solution to lighten up the overall mood, the young lady had already done so. In a blink of an eye, Rory went back to her jolly facade and expressed her own excitement. Shall we have another round of Uno? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He wasn't shy about describing how the base had abruptly and dramatically transformed into some sort of mini-city. He had suspected, however, that those new lights could be newer camps established as part of the coalition's plan to push out of the region. Furthermore, it wasn't that difficult for the other recon teams to bring in refugees who had been displaced from their homes, which is why there were already lights in some areas. It could be either of the two hypotheses, but he had hoped for the better. A lot has happened in just a few days. The Japanese-American man couldn't believe what he and the rest of the recon team had to endure. Arriving in a small village with a small internal conflict, accursed land, demonic beings, and supernatural ordeals. Would anyone believe it if those events occurred in his world? For the first time, the man had decided not to finish continue writing the chapters in his drafts at this late hour for the simple reason that he was exhausted and wanted to enjoy the wonders of his surroundings. And he can't help but think of a certain person. This sure is a scary and wild world. He muttered as if he was talking to that particular person. Never knew these things could really happen. He added, somehow there was still disbelief left inside. Do you think this place is very different from what we imagine? For the first time, he was able to release some of his emotions. During those ordeals, he felt fear, uncertainty, and the need to make sense of what was happening in front of him. It's too otherworldly to be true, yet he forced himself to deal with the situation and learned what he could learn, as this was part of his job. It was the only time he felt free to be himself. He quickly became immersed in the silence around him, and just as he was about to clear his mind, he felt this subtle tap from behind, and he immediately turned around only to face nothing. He blinked a couple of times, wondering if that was just only a part of his imagination. Soon his attention was drawn to the nearby LAV, where the rest of his equipment and bag was stored. From a few meters away he could spot something attached or placed beside the vehicle's window. The man immediately wasted no time and approached the LAV to investigate further, and by the time he arrived at the said spot, he widened his eyes in surprise and curiosity. Just in the lower corner of the window and on the windshield's grasps was a small brown envelope. Yuji proceeded to take the brown envelope and to further examine it. Its appearance can be compared to that of an 18th century parchment material. Upon further observation, he spotted its only word which turned out to be his name. His heartbeat stopped for a few moments before proceeding to open the letter and once he saw the contents, he was overwhelmed with surprise. Dear Mr. Takamori, if you found and received this letter then that means you and your friends have finally made it safely across the land. I humbly extend my gratitude to you and your people for saving the village and the land itself from the old curse that plagued the place for centuries. Because of your kind help and efforts, you and your people have prevented more lives from being lost. I know that this would temporarily confuse you, but I assure you that all your questions would be answered in time. After all, this is only the beginning. Yours humbly, Duke. The man was lost for words as he finished the last sentence of the letter. He did feel glad to learn that they had something good for the place, yet he was still overwhelmed with confusion and curiosity. The name struck familiarity to him and not for long, he finally recalled the big humble merchantman that the recon team had come across several days ago. Of course, the obvious question was, how did the letter get here? The wind grew stronger again. For the next hours, he was left to wonder about the mysteries that were given to him. A bit annoying that he received them at this time of the hour, as he already had planned on relaxing all throughout the night. Yuji sighed again, choosing to take another gaze at the beautiful moon and back towards Fort Almas. With all the new information coming in, he wasn't really sure what would be the next step forward. Although, he was aware that in just a matter of days that he would be entering the next arc of the story and a realization that quickly came up to him. Looks like we won't be going home soon. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
She didn't waste any time and headed towards her wood destination. How many times did this scenario ever happen? She couldn't even recall and even the number of scars and wounds that she sustained all over the years couldn't even help her to begin with. Vested by a power only a few individuals like her could wield, she felt she could accomplish anything, yet it was still not enough to face this kind of monster. She has always worked alone, regardless of how intense her loneliness was. As long as she could finally make up for the failures of her predecessors and how many redemptions she could claim. When a small light began to flash, she realized she was getting close to her destination. Soon after, the specific light in the forest began to grow larger, and it appeared to be a massive fire that engulfed that specific in the shape of a circle. The shock in her eyes was visible upon seeing it. Was she too late to arrive? No. 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 She kept repeating the word inside her head. Her hope was slowly dwindling. She gripped her giant scythe to prepare for a possible re-emergence of the beast from the giant fire itself. However, as soon as she arrived, a small ball of fire erupted from another part of the forest, which immediately caught her attention. She widened her eyes in surprise, immediately shifting her gaze to the mentioned area. The young lady took this as a beacon and signal and proceeded straight towards the land. Despite the fact that it was the peak of the night, she could see a lot of people on that particular land, and when she landed, she was greeted by an even more surprising sight. The apostle recognized all of the torches that the men were carrying. Apparently, the villagers were all here, able to flee their homes just in time before the red dragon's arrival and wrath. As a result, the young lady breathed a sigh of relief. Ms. Giselle, the voice calling her out was enough to catch her attention. She then shifted her gaze towards the villagers, especially a young boy, who turned out to be the one she was also searching for. Albrecht, by the gods, you're okay, she exclaimed, hugging the young boy briefly. Is this all of the villagers? she asked, looking around her surroundings. The boy nodded in return, before shifting his gaze towards two familiar dragons, who were still kept on guard and alert from any approaching danger. I couldn't have done the task without Mado and Toato, he explained, forcing a grin, and thankful for their assistance. And just as the draconian young woman was about to speak, a huge menacing roar erupted throughout the premises, enough to frighten the hardy and determined villagers. Quickly, leave this place as soon as possible, she instructed the boy. You know where to bring them, she went on to say. The young boy nodded in understanding as he immediately called out to the rest of the village folk to follow him to the path he was going to take. The draconian gave a small smile and cast a sympathetic glance at the young but brave dragons, who were willing to risk their lives just to keep their half-mother from going insane again. As for the apostle herself, she could only sigh in resignation, knowing that whatever actions her predecessors had committed before she fully took the position to which now had been placed as an annoying burden on her. This wasn't a fight she had to choose, but rather an obligation she had to bear. Not long after, the massive red silhouette of the flame dragon emerged from the fires, looming over her. She tightened her grip on her weapon and forced a cringe and a smile before taking off with the two dragons as they faced the beast once more. She, on the other hand, could only mutter a phrase. Here we go again. Chapter End And hello there fellas. So this chapter is going to be the final one for the first arc and as well as a continuation, giving more screen time and interactions for the main characters. This is mostly like a calm after the storm chapter again. To further add, the scenes mostly have that slice of life genre and as well as a few foreshadowings. Don't be alarmed regarding some of the characters such as the little demi-human bunny in the Furuta scene. They are basically just part of the foreshadowing of what is to come. Though I have to admit that, I am also exploring the idea as well. The last scene with a certain person, who you all probably know. It was actually a last minute idea to replace the original scene, main characters finally arriving at Alnus Hill. A reader suggests that it would be a good teaser for the next arc that would coincide with the Quatoin Principality scene. And yes, I am not going to recreate the flame dragon attacking the recon team in the middle of the fields. It's been often shown in many fix already and I wanted to reimagine that certain arc in a different place and situation altogether. Not in some random field or even Alnus Hill, but in a different place and scenario altogether. 
regarding Mauto and Toato, their past and how they came to be, are pretty much similar to the original series but this time the situation is very different, hence why they are acting this way. The whole flame dragon thing has potential but it was wasted and became just a small section in the original series where the thing is portrayed as a generic evil, dragon saga. In my head I was thinking, what if that particular arc had more story and background to it? What if the flame dragon was once just a nice creature who wanted to be left alone? And that something or someone has ruined her life and stolen something precious from her. For which is a reason that she seeks vengeance. For the lovely Giselle, her appearance, her background are similar to the original. But I decided to make her life and situation more interesting and relatable as I do hope. And rather than just a bored apostle being irresponsible and creating idiotic things everywhere that could cause deaths. With that said, thank you very much for spending time to read the chapter. I really appreciate it. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you so much and God bless. 18. Arc 2. Interlude. Memoirs of a Merchant. Venturing with Bravery. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2. Interlude. Memoirs of a Merchant. Venturing with Bravery. Ah, the sounds of these iron monsters could definitely intimidate and spook even the menacing beasts that dwell beyond this region. As a matter of fact, I am impressed to see how these otherworldly people are very much determined to push out of this land towards the heart of the continent. These moving metal carriages, flying iron valkyries, and giant green elephant-like weapons with their long pointy noses could unleash even powerful magic that no one has seen before. All in all just to save their kind and as well as to find a solution to finally end the senseless conflict which plagues this very land. The gates of their fortress had opened again, as they finally venture out to the wilderness to fulfill their duties. I am confident that there are places waiting to be saved, particularly those of great significance that could usher in the first change and turning point in the history of this great land. I hope the greater powers from above will guide them as they have all the tools and valuable information provided by people of goodwill. With all of these places inset, the journey continues once again. And this may be a preview and a prologue at the same time that I could write for now, since the actual chapter is still in the works and pretty much won't be out soon since real life matters and writer's depression are in the way again. Sighs, but other than that, thank you for giving time to read the chapter. 17. Arc 2. An Immediate Beginning. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nyankoku Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 2, A City, A Diplomacy A Dragon, An Immediate Beginning. It's a pleasure to meet you General Hanzama. He couldn't recall how many times he had heard the phrase. In fact, it seemed almost every day that he had been hearing the same greeting every time unique visitors would enter his office and extend their own gratitudes. Towards him, the man wearily smiled. Is this how being a hero feels like? The thought ran through his mind as the Japanese general entertained the recent visitor in front of him, who was revealed to be a beastkin or a demi-human of origin, some kind of muscular and hunky wolf man, donning an ancient-like battle attire along with a short cape on his back. Hanzama-san, this is Chief Arnu, of the Lycan Wolf Beast tribe hailing from the northern lands. There was something unique and different about the names of the locals here. A kind of enigmatic aura that manifests itself simply by the manner in which they introduce themselves. As for this large demi-human, his identity, life, and culture are clearly visible through his clothing. The rest of the staff was used to seeing how these locals dressed, but they couldn't stop themselves from bringing up their cameras and secretly taking pictures. A certain glasses-wearing Yanagita said as the man introduced the latter to one of the heads of the coalition. Soon enough, he gestured towards a nearby staff to prepare the tapes, as this would eventually produce valuable information. And so the man had pressed the small button as the tape began to record the conversation. General Hanzama smiled as he quickly shook hands with the wolf chief before gesticulating towards the chair. Feel free to take a seat, Chief Arnu, he said. Thank you, General. The man then cleared his throat. So, sir, what brings you here? The Japanese general inquired. The same words he'd been saying for the past few hours since arriving at work. The wolf chief chuckled and a thankful expression emerged from him. I am just here to personally thank you for saving and helping my tribe, he explained. 
If it weren't for your green men, we wouldn't have made it past the river, he went on to say, and we wouldn't have survived long dealing with those cursed creatures. General Hanzema nodded in understanding as a small smile swept across his lips. The term men in green or green men had already risen in popularity amongst the locals in the region at least. Day by day, numerous groups which consist of tribes, displaced villagers, and the occasional merchants, who just want to protect and preserve their livelihoods, often found themselves stumbling upon a mysterious and iron fortress in the middle of a forgotten land. I am aware of it, Chief Anu, he replied. Even our men, who had reported the case, were definitely shocked and horrified that such creatures existed. He added his own comment, expressing his desire to learn more about these beings. The wolf chief nodded. Yes, the creatures your men encountered were once humans themselves, he explained. Peaceful farmers and villagers who had turned to vengeance to kill those responsible for destroying their lives. He paused, recalling countless stories passed down from his ancestors. So how did they become what they are today? The wolf chief nodded. According to written accounts, they wanted their enemies out of their lands so badly that they allegedly made a deal with a demon, or a corrupt mage to hasten up to. Their goals, he explained, expressing sadness over what had happened to the once peaceful clans, and that cost their minds and humanity. The room fell silent. There seemed to be far too much tragedy in every story told by the locals. I am very sorry to hear that, chief, General Hanzama apologized. But tell me, how bad was the situation in the land before your tribe decided to leave? He followed up with. The chief wanted to remain silent but as much as he wished not to discuss the matter, a part of him began to cheer as he sensed genuine hope in these men and wondered if they were the only ones who could put an end to the madness. The goatmen always lived together in one area, and whenever they wanted to travel to another place, they all ventured in packs, he explained, but only within the land in which they resided. And why is that? Curiosity's peak and eyebrows were raised. It's that simple, Chief Arnu responded. The land my tribe formerly lived in is already cursed, and those creatures are so obsessed with dark powers that they would rather remain within the land to feed off the energy itself. But you mentioned that the curse originated from a corrupt mage, who transformed them? It was Yanagida, who spoke this time, catching the attention of the rest. The rest of the staff were a bit surprised since the man had no interest in learning such lore. The wolf chief smiled. Yes, though that mage is already dead killed by his own minions, whom he had previously corrupted, he explained with a small sigh. However, the dark curse that he had cast remained in the form of some small crystal that the goat men had acquired after killing him, and now it resides in the heart of their settlement. To think that such situations could really happen, though one of our brethren did manage to scout the place and find the exact location of the crystal, he sighed once more. The mission nearly cost his own life and as much as we wanted to end their terror, we cannot since we do not have the proper tools nor the right people to handle the situation, he explained. However, we did ask for assistance to some nearby guilds yet their mages and other parties were away on their own missions. He further explained, feeling the stress coming back, every time he recalled those days. And in addition, it's quite the price to hire them and their expertise nowadays. To the eyes of many, Guilds were the only solution for these kinds of problems that deal with the out of the ordinary. The individuals that worked there all their lives were heroes to the many locals that lived in fear in these lands. Guilds? As in adventure guilds? I remember playing a game where your character starts its quest in a guild before. So that means heroes do exist in this world? Small gossips and whispers filled the rest of the staff, who were present in the room. General Hanzema's interests peak. I see, so these guilds, how and where can we establish contact with them? A brief moment of silence followed as the wolf chief flashed a small smile. You don't have to worry, general, he reassured the Japanese man. I could help you connect with the right people, he explained. One of our fellow tribe scouts knew exactly where the guilds were, and fortunately, it was only a short distance from our original home. You won't have a difficult time locating them. The man nodded in understanding. I see. General Hanzama muttered, beckoning a certain staff to head towards a certain place. Thank you, Chief Arnu, he then said and smiled. I believe this information would be also useful for General Wilkes. The wolf beast chief nodded. 
Oh, the other general, he said, quite the serious one he is. But he did seem to care about the well-being of his men and his goals, he added. The Japanese general sighed. We're all on the same page, chief, he said simply, before adding, our people are still in this world, waiting to be rescued and doing their best to survive whatever horrors this empire will bring. The chief's eyes widened at this point. Now that you've mentioned it, I recall our scouts seeing groups of imperial soldiers with numerous cages heading northwest, he explained. I believe inside those cages are displaced and captured villagers and as well as the people you're looking for, he explained. Imperial soldiers? Yes, we believe they had established a base or camp that could not be too far away from the mountains. The wolf chief simply nodded. Another wolf tribe, the Valradin, could help your men lead the way to the heart of it, he continued. They are more adventurous and battle-oriented than we are. As crucial information was eventually revealed, all eyebrows were raised. The tape had managed to record everything, as it would be delivered to the intelligence division and the key people in charge of outside operations and reconnaissance. I understand, Chief Arna. Once again the general let out a smile. We are grateful for the information you've provided, he said before adding, and rest assured that your tribe, like the other villagers who have nowhere else to go, will find safety here. He finished his sentence. As the conversation came to a close, the rest of the staff returned to their work, as the usual busy atmosphere had returned to the establishment. The wolf chief, on the other hand, had one more question on his mind that seemed very important to him at the time. General, if I may inquire, what is that small white contraption attached to the wall? He inquired, pointing out the strange coldness produced by the object. What sort of cooling magic does that thing present? A brief moment of silence followed after. Um, it's what we call an air conditioner, sir, Yanagita explained this time. And it doesn't contain or produce magic. Oh, then what is it? Another curious question came. I believe that is what we call science in our world, sir, replied the younger Japanese man. Chief Arna's eyes widened with delight. To think that living in very humid weather is now tolerable because there are objects that can provide a cool environment to get you away from the annoying feeling of needness. His curiosity was piqued further when the man in green mentioned a word he had never heard before. Fascinating, he commented. So how does this science work in your world? As for General Hanzama, the older man just sighed and placed a hand on his forehead while forcing a small smile. It's complicated. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X An hour had passed since his conversation with another village leader had commenced. At long last he could finally rest his aching back on the chair, to which he had not rested on for a good amount of time. He felt like wanting to give in to his temptation and let his weary eyes shut and sleep. General Hanzama never felt this tired before. The only thing that was keeping him focused was a cup of hot coffee on his desk. He took a sip after the meeting ended, as the prospect of yet another visit from a village leader lingered in his mind. Furthermore, he had more matters to attend to and discuss with the other officials regarding the diplomatic envoy and the remaining vacant slot for the escorts as they begin their operation to establish proper contact with the principality. Nonetheless, the prospect of meeting with a slew of local leaders had lingered in his mind. Does God only know how many were lined up behind that door or was it just his own imagination? Tell me, Yenagida, how long is a line from behind the door? He asked, expressing the precise words that were clouding his mind. The younger man raised an eyebrow in confusion before realizing the situation. He sighed but slightly chuckled. Well, sir, I'd like to be the bearer of good news, but Chief Arna is the last village leader for the day, he informed the older man and it's been an hour since our last meeting. The Japanese general remained silent as he took in the information. He shook his head slowly, forcing a small weary smile. So far, their method of gathering important information, even in the most basic of meetings, is working very well. Almost all of the local leaders they've met and spoken with have relayed information and locations about the activities of the so-called Sadran Empire. Recon teams are arriving with the people they have rescued along the way, day by day. They were well aware that this was only the beginning and that they still had a long way to go, but they knew they were on the right track. I'm guessing more recon teams are on their way? General Hanzama asked, smirking slightly. 
Most of the teams have arrived, he replied, adjusting his glasses as he read the contents of his clipboard, which was on top of two thick folders containing recent reports from a specific recon team. Though, I saved the best for last, he finished as he placed the two folders on the desk. Silence befell the room once more. A hint of realization could be seen in the older man's eyes as he stared in disbelief. Does that mean? Yanagita simply nodded. Yes, sir. Itami and his team had finally arrived, he informed the man, and they brought along a hundred more villagers. A hundred? General Hanzama's eyes widened even more. That's the highest number brought by a reconnaissance team, the younger man sighed this time. Well, this is third recon we are talking about, he commented, having the urge to say the moniker that closely ties in with the team and while presenting another folder on the desk and they were able to bring along several important people that could really help us turn the tide this time. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
are unable to protect the untainted lands due to the demon army's superior force. She paused. Many valiant warriors were crushed, and the most talented mages fell, and eventually the demon army reached and invaded the elves' last bastion, the sacred forest, the sanctuary of the goddess of life. And this is where the emissaries would come right into play? The old lady smiled and simply nodded. And during those supposed last hours of destruction, it was when the prayers of all races were answered. Thus the emissaries arrived with their divine flying ships and cast fearsome sorcery that summoned thunderous lightning that set the ground ablaze, driving off the demon army. The man had chills up and down his spine, and his hair stood up from his skin, hearing this story as if it were a testimony or a true story. However, a part of him became more interested in the so-called divine flying ships. So what happened next ma'am? The old lady took a deep breath and continued. With emissaries' powerful magic, the army was driven back to the land where they came from, and many of their lords perished during the event. She paused for a brief moment. As a result, the alliance was able to recover and regroup, defeating the general of the demon army, who had attempted to flee and hide in another land, and then cornering the demon lord himself, whom the alliance's remaining heroes had sacrificed their lives just to vanquish. Word by word, it began to conjure up a scenario in his head. Yuji saw bright flashes of powerful light and the demon lord's deafening roar in the midst of multiple explosions falling from the sky before his eyes. Was this just a series of imaginative scenarios playing out in front of him, or was this a vision from the past? When the terror was over, the emissaries were summoned back to their home, but despite being offered gifts and treasures, they politely declined and left on their own accord toward the sunset. The old lady finished her sentence as she finally got to the most important part of the story. Did this really happen ma'am? Yuji asked, only to receive a chuckle. To tell you the truth young man, nobody knows if it did really happen. There are just many stories in this world that people find it difficult to believe, she explained. But if you were to ask me, I do believe it, since it is a reminder for everyone living in this world that we should put our own selfish ambitions aside and unite together to maintain the peace which was promised long ago. She pointed it out, before sighing in disappointment. Yuji simply nodded in understanding. Even back in his world, where greed and selfishness still reign in every aspect. But then I realized that I won't be able to witness that peace being achieved, at least not in my lifetime. A sad smile crept across her lips. All I want is for the children to grow up normally and not have to go through what I have gone through. The area fell silent once more as the wind grew stronger. At that very moment, that silence was quickly broken as sounds of a familiar engine roaring in the area were heard. Look, it's a moving metal box again. One of the children in the playground exclaimed, followed by the cheers that erupted by the rest of them, as excitement filled their hearts and minds. It's one of the men in green again, another village kid commented. Despite their parents' concerns, the children proceeded to the location where the green moving metal box had stopped, and after a while, the door to the moving contraption finally opened, revealing a familiar face. As the scene progressed, Itami found himself surrounded by a swarm of curious and excited children. All of them tried to catch a glimpse of the LAV and get his attention as if he were some celebrity, despite the fact that there was some truth to it. Yuji wasn't too late to see the scene and shook his head with a small chuckle. He rose from his seat and thanked the old village lady politely for being interviewed before proceeding to confront the lieutenant. Not too long, the two men had finally met face to face once again. Itami. Hey man, I just knew you would be here. His friend grinned, briefly shaking hands with him. So this is what you've been doing for the past several days. The man smiled in response. Yeah, been interacting with the locals and learning their culture at first hand, he explained. And it's going great so far. I see. Itami nodded as he took a quick look around. Well, to get right to the point, I have some news that you might be interested in, he said with a small grin. His friend raised both eyebrows, before slowly coming into realization. You don't mean that dash? Yes, General Hanzama has called for a meeting today and that includes certain people like you and me, Itami simply nodded. I guess, it's finally happening. He shrugged and said, feeling a little amused. 
to think that they would be selected to fill in the slot for the next major mission was just as surprising as the last one. So where do we go from here? The Japanese lieutenant then raised his hand and pointed towards a certain direction. To meet some old friends first. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
silence befell for a few moments before the elf girl could fully recover her senses. She blinked a couple of times before giving a small smile. Mr. Higashi, it's been a while. She greeted in return before adding, I didn't expect you would be here as well. She wondered. The man sighed and smiled. Yeah, we're just delivering some medical supplies to the clinics around the camp. He explained, taking a glance at the building itself. I guess, this is the first clinic, and then we got nine more to go. He added. I see. Tuka nodded in understanding. How are the others by the way? She asked. Oh, you mean the guys? He said. Well, a lot of them had been assigned into different tasks around the base since returning. He then continued. Mari-san had been helping with the clinics lately with Nurse Karina, Shino-san grinding herself in the gym with Tomita, Itami-san helping the locals get comfy around the surroundings here and... I can't really much recall what the others are doing nowadays, he he. The man forced a grin while scratching the back of his head. It's all right, I understand. Tuka responded with a small smile as she was beginning to daze off to the blank space once more. It seems everybody had their own businesses to mind, which left her in a somewhat bland situation. There was nothing that much to look forward to except for certain news she had been anticipating since the meeting behind closed doors with the heads of the coalition. If she remembered correctly, today was that day she had been looking forward to and she found herself still not prepared for the event. It was already bothering her to an extent where she began to doubt her own confidence. Yet, it was a part of her main goals since arriving here. In the words of the JSDF soldier, who somewhat had a similar thought in mind, You know Tukasan, I have a feeling that we'll get ourselves to a new place and a new situation again. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The older elf had taken notice of it. Are you all right? He asked, looking straight at her in the eyes. Her quietness continued as the smile around her lips turned into a more worrisome look. The elf man sighed. Look, if this is about your request of volunteering with them on going to my hark, I have no problem with that, he explained. You have my support, but just be careful out there. He smiled, never forgetting to remind her. However, the girl shook her head. It's not about going to my hark. Then what is it? I am just worried about him, and as well as the others too. She finally explained, referring to her childhood friend and the rest of the Koan villagers she knew and also loved. I hope they made it to the city, she added, trying not to let the various emotions take over. The wind grew stronger as silence returned. The distance between her original home and the principality was no bluff. Normally, it would take more than five days to get there, and a lot would happen during those days. Be it confrontations with imperial cavalry, violent ambushes by bandits and deadly creatures, or simply an uneventful journey if luck was on their side. Worst case scenarios that could happen, yet she had no idea if it really did happen and still let them bother her throughout the day. Hotter sighed, before pulling the girl into an embrace. You're just like your mother, he commented. Always had the worrisome face all the time. He gave a little chuckle as bits of memories resurfaced again. But don't dwell on those thoughts, Tuka, he assured her. I know in my heart they made it there, he added, despite his own worries. Besides, you have the companions and people to support and be there beside you. Her father's words did calm her down, and as she was about to speak, the roaring sounds of a vehicle interrupted her followed by a certain voice. Ms. Tuka, Mr. Hodder. Both father and daughter then turned around to see two familiar faces on a green horseless metal carriage parked near the fence. The men, who were later revealed to be Yuji and Itami, waved their hands in greeting. We just got news from headquarters. They want you guys to be part of the meeting, Itami exclaimed and informed the two. The elf man smiled back and waved at them in return. Thank you very much. Give us time to prepare and we'll be there. He then looked back towards his daughter with yet another encouraging look, and much to the latter's surprise that fate finally calls for her again. Tuka could only sigh and gave a small nod. Her attention then shifted towards her bow and arrow which was placed beside a wooden made circular target. I guess it's time. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I suggest that land travel would be the most preferable way to reach the principality, and the only thing you would need is to take a safe passage that would lead you directly there to the place itself undetected from enemy eyes. The young mage proposed, finishing her speech altogether, and took a glance at her teacher, who was sitting at a corner along with the quiet Rory herself. Silence filled the room once again, followed by the chatters amongst the men. It did truly confirm some of the doubts that using air transport for the diplomatic envoy to the nation itself could cause conflicts. Occasional arguments had been plaguing recent discussions regarding the matter as it would be the fastest way to make contact, though if only the consequences were aside. General Wilkes had kept quiet as to absorb the new information at hand, though he was glad that there was no need for a translator because of the missing language barrier. The little stress still kicked in knowing that there was going to be a lot of adjustments to the main plan. However, the only problem that they have right now is to find a guide that actually knew the so-called secret passage. In the midst of the silence, one of the officials spoke up. Well, we do have a local, who is willing to volunteer to act as a guide. The official informed the rest, garnering the rest of everyone's attention. General Wilkes raised an eyebrow in surprise. Uh... The report just came as recently as this week. He scrambled a few pages from the file. He claims to know a secret passage that would lead us directly to the destination since most of the roads and bridges were purposely destroyed to prevent any of this invasion from happening, he explained. I see. The American coalition general sighed. Well, we did send out a couple of drones to mark the path's exact location. And surprisingly, it's all true and we actually found it. The official said, handing down copies of the alleged aerial image of the secret pathway. It kinda looks like a normal dirt road except it's surrounded by hills. Another official spoke. He shrugged. Yes, and there is a whole story regarding that pathway but I think it's best for me to tell that story later on. The official said, making way for the main discussion to continue. General Wilkes nodded in understanding as he focused his eyes on the young mage, who in turn had given him a certain expression. Oh, I almost forgot. Ms. Lillet, I'm pleased to inform you that your request has been granted. He smiled for the first time. You'll be going with the team as a guide along with your friends. He added, just be sure, you'll find what you're searching for. The young mage simply nodded in return. She felt a sense of gladness inside as she could finally gather the information she dearly needed from a certain place in the principality itself. Thank you, General. The girl spoke and slightly bowed, heading back towards her former seat beside her master. By then all eyes had shifted towards the next person in line to speak. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
so from what I have heard, you'll be escorting a diplomatic envoy of your world to the principality. A nod came from Itami. The news had been out for a while amongst the team. Correct sir, though the plans are still in the final stages. The Japanese man informed. Just making sure we won't spook the heck out of the people there. He added. I see. It was understandable given that remaining nations, such as the principality, had been on high alert for a long time due to the ongoing conflict and the so-called conquest of this empire, which was also responsible for attempting to claim lands beyond the gate, or so he had been told since his youth. Nobody knows why that kingdom was doing all of this even though, there was really nothing to gain from the remaining nations. The common reason was to maintain their pridefulness, and to show the other civilizations that they have the worthiness to join them. He laughed, and dismissed the outdated idea. If I may ask sir, where do you think you'll be heading after you finally decided? Yuji said, a little curiosity clinging to him. Hodder slightly smiled, remaining quiet for a few moments before looking up at the clear sky, seeing a certain white dove flying over the land as it headed towards the north. I think I know. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
who was offering her a Twinkie.